Island Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. So, members are very welcome to the Executive Office Committee meeting. Uh, we're being recorded and broadcast as well at the moment. Uh, I've mentioned to members about mobile devices and making sure that they're kept clear of the uh, microphones. In terms of apologies today, we have an apology from Christopher Stalford. Everybody else except George is here, and hopefully when he joins us in Spotlight we'll see him, and if he needs to ask questions, he can. Item 2 is the draft minutes. There was a meeting held on the 16th of, of September, uh, and those minutes are at page 5 of the meeting pack. Are members content that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings <coughs> of the meeting? Yep. Yep. 
Okay, so we have those signed. Um, there are no matters arising which will allow us to move straight into the Brexit to the oral evidence session with the junior ministers on Brexit issues. Members, on page 11 of the meeting pack, um, um, I would ask you also to look at page 3 of the tabled pack for the departmental briefing that was received late but uh, was circulated to members on Friday evening. Also included in the table papers at page 9 is correspondence from the Department notifying the Committee that an extraordinary meeting of the EU-UK Joint Committee took place on the 10th of September. Um, we appreciate that it was all very last minute and there wasn't time to give advance notice, uh, but we are being told about the meeting 12 days after it happened. Uh, at page 10 is a note of the Executive's action at the JMC. EN meeting that took place on the 16th of July. Um, it's taken over two months to be told that that has happened. And at page 14 is a note of the executive's action uh, at the JMC EM meeting held on the 3rd of September. Um, at page 18 is a copy of correspondence from the Welsh Legislation, Justice and Constitution Committee to the Secretary of State for Wales seeking clarity around the Sewell. Convention and the UK Internal Market Bill. Uh, would members agree, maybe, if we ask them for a copy of the response that they get? Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, members, Junior Minister Kearney and Junior Minister Lyons are in attendance today to brief us on the Brexit issue and to answer questions. Ministers, you're very welcome to the meeting today. Um, just again that you've been recorded and it's on Hansard. Uh, maybe just to pass over to yourselves and let you give us an update and then we'll let members ask questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr Chairman, I'm glad to be able to uh, be here uh, again today uh, in front of the committee. Um, we last briefed the committee on the 24th of June. I believe you had a, um, a f officials before you on the, on the 29th of July, and we are happy to provide a monthly update um, on EU exit matters as we resolve to do at the last meeting. Additionally, I believe that officials are scheduled to provide a briefing on common frameworks on the 7th of October, and the First and Deputy First Ministers will also be there at that day to provide an update on um, departmental issues more generally. Uh, we understand the committee has also requested specific uh, briefing on issues associated with EU exit, and we're working to uh, agree a schedule of dates so that we can uh, meet that request. You will obviously have received our briefing paper uh, ahead of today's meeting, and we intend to update you on progress made over the last number of weeks on a range of uh, areas in relation to EU exit. So, uh, let me start by providing an update on the meetings of the Joint uh, Committee and Specialised Committee since our last committee appearance. We'll also touch on the Internal Market Bill and the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, as you will have been aware and have been made aware, an extraordinary meeting of the uh, Joint Committee took place on the 10th of September. Uh, the meeting was requested by the European Commission to seek clarifications from the UK on the full and timely imp implementation of the withdrawal agreement, including the protocol following the publication of the UK Internal Market Bill the day before. Uh, the meeting was chaired jointly uh, by the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, um, the Right Honourable Michael Gove, and European Commission uh, Vice President uh, Maros Sefcovic. All 27 EU member states were present, and both the First and Deputy First Minister joined the meeting by teleconference. During the meeting, both sides stated their positions, with the East EU side requesting that the UK should withdraw the internal market proposals, and the UK underlining that they were fully committed to the implementation of the protocol and the technical discussions that we're seeking that we're seeking to resolve the issues. The EU representatives were to report back to the Commission President, the European Parliament and Member States, and committed to come back to members of the Joint Committee in due course. We understand that there has since been correspondence um, from uh, Maro Sefcovic to Michael Gove asking that the UK withdraw certain articles from the UK Internal Market Bill, which the EU considers to breach the substantive provisions of the protocol, and they want that done before the end of September. The next scheduled meeting of the Joint Committee is due to take place on Monday, the 28th of September. And at present, we do not have details of an agreed agenda, but we expect it to cover all the outstanding issues relating to the withdrawal agreement, including an update on implementation of the protocol. The other protocols to the withdrawal agreement, such as uh, relating to Gibraltar 
and on technical discussions between the two sides. In regards to the specialised uh, committee, there has not yet been a meeting of the Ireland Northern Ireland Specialised Committee since before the summer, and the timing of the next meeting will depend on progress at the technical level. In relation to the Internal Market Bill, the UK Government consulted on its uh, UK internal market proposals in July and August. The Executive considered the proposals and issued an agreed response to the Internal Market Consultation on the 12th of August, prior to the introduction of the Bill to Parliament in September. The Executive believes strongly that our vitally important relationship with the markets of England, Scotland and Wales must be protected for the benefit of our businesses and consumers, and that the proposals to legislate would be one of the most important determinants of our business market access for years to come. And this position was reflected in the Executive's consultation response. You will be aware that the introduction of the Bill has proved contentious, given the provisions within the Bill to give UK Ministers powers to amend how the UK could implement the protocol. <coughs> Key decisions are not reached with the EU through the Joint Committee. It will be important for the Executive to consider all aspects of the Bill, and in particular its impact on its devolved responsibilities. In relation to the protocol, clarity on the implementation of the protocol and the impact on our businesses and citizens remains the top cross-cutting priority issue for us. Our priority remains to secure unfettered access for Northern Ireland goods to the GP market as well as the minimum possible friction on east to west movement of goods. Access to the GB market remains a vital economic interest to our businesses, and we continue to press the UK Government to ensure their commitment in the command paper is delivered to support current trade and the future strength of our economy. The UK Government published NI Business Guidance in August, uh, which was an important step forward. However, as the UK Government recognised in the guidance, there are, there are outstanding issues on which discussion is ongoing. We continue to press the UK Government for clarity on these issues, including any confusion uh, for businesses. Uh, the Trader Support Service announced by the UK Government in August will be a valuable support to businesses, and we would encourage our businesses to avail of this service. We are all aware that our businesses and our economy face many pressures associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uncertainty around implementation of the protocol and its interaction with the outcome of the negotiations is causing added pressure and anxiety. We are therefore extremely concerned about business readiness for the end of the transition period and that the limited time businesses will have to prepare will not be adequate, which will likely result in a further negative impact on our economy. And so we continue uh, to press the UK government for progress uh, to address the uncertainty uh, for our businesses uh, and indeed uh, our citizens. I hope that's been uh, of some help. I'll hand over now to, to Declan, who will continue on other issues. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon, and thanks, Colin. So, in my remarks, I'm going to cover uh, the executive consideration of EU exit matters, operational readiness, negotiations, the JMC for uh, European negotiations, <coughs> EU exit-related legislation, and then the rights and the dedicated mechanism uh, issues. The Executive Committee dealing with EU exit matters continues to meet each week. Recent discussions at the meetings have covered topics such as uh, data, data exchange, EU programme participation, Peace Plus, and open and fair competition, as well as regular updates on stakeholder engagement and the progress of negotiations and the JMC uh, EN meetings themselves. As Gordon referred to, we have agreed a response and issued to the consultation on the Internal Market Bill, and we have since, as an executive, discussed the implications of the Bill following publication. We have also discussed the issue of points of entry in order to fulfil the obligations set out in the protocol. We are, of course, in agreement on the need to secure the best outcome for the North and on the need to ensure goods can legally enter the North on 1 January 2021. The Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has since commenced commencement the procurement process for points of entry. 
Negotiations on the future relationship between the British Government and the EU continued over the summer, with the most recent formal negotiating round concluding on 12 September. And the final negotiation round will take place in Brussels in the week commencing 28 October. We understand that the negotiation teams have continued informal discussions in the interim. You will be aware from the statements on both sides that significant areas of divergence remain, and these relate specifically to open and fair competition, fisheries, subsidy control or state aid, and that these gaps are going to be difficult to bridge without a political intervention. Boris Johnson has stated his aim of completing the negotiations by the middle of October in order to allow for ratification by the October Council, that is at the end of uh, October itself. Whilst we welcome the continued commitment from both negotiation teams to reach an agreement on the future relationship, negotiations which stretch beyond this point are going to have an inevitable impact on the time available to prepare for either a deal or a no-deal outcome. As has been the case throughout the negotiations, responsibility for concluding this agreement lies within the competence of the British Government, and we have shared that assessment with the Committee in the past. The Executive continues to take every opportunity to engage with the British Government and the Task Force Europe negotiators to ensure that the future relationship which we will have best reflects the interests of our people, our businesses and our regional and our island economy. Indeed, the Deputy First Minister and Gordon himself and myself reiterated that very point to the EU Ambassador to Britain when uh, we met together last Thursday. The Joint Heads of Government also wrote to Michael Gove on 10 September to emphasise the critical importance of rules of origin in these negotiations and their potential impact on our economy. So we continue to press on the impact of interdependencies between the negotiations on the future relationship with the EU and, of course, in relation to the implementation, the full implementation <coughs> of the protocol. There is a huge potential for negative consequences, albeit unintended, for our people and our businesses if there is not a joined-up approach achieved. Since our last appearance at this committee, there have also been two meetings of the JMC for European negotiations, and those took place on the 16th of July and the 3rd of September. And Gordon and I accompanied both uh, heads of government to both of those meetings. The agendas have included negotiations with the EU, updates on transition readiness, including the legislative timetable and implementation of the protocol, as well as progress on work on the UK common frameworks. At the most recent meeting on 3 September, two frameworks received provisional confirmation by the GM, JMC, and they related to hazardous substances, planning and nutrition, health claims, and also composition and labelling. And those frameworks will now move to scrutiny here by the relevant Assembly Committee and another legislatures in uh, Wales and in Scotland. <coughs> the main points we made at the meeting on 3 September included concerns about the limited time available for an agreement on the future relationship to be concluded, ratified and then implemented before the end of the transition period at the end of this year. <coughs> we also addressed the need for political intervention to reach an agreement and the need to take into account the interactions between the negotiations on the future relationship and the protocol itself, particularly in specific key areas such as SPS checks. We understand that officials, as Gordon said earlier, will be providing a specific briefing to the Committee on the Common Frameworks Programme on the 7th of October, and they will be in a position to provide further detail at that session. As we informed you at our last appearance, the Executive are undertaking operational readiness planning, which do include the option of a non-negotiated outcome. I know this committee has discussed before the implications of a non-negotiated outcome in general, and in particular in regard to how the protocol would work in practice with other arrangements such as WTO trading rules. It is worth noting 
that whatever the outcome of the current negotiations, the protocol will still come into force on 1 January 2021. We have some degree of certainty on that regard, but of course the impact of a no-deal outcome would still be very significant for us all. In a non-negotiated outcome, it will be important to understand where mitigations lie, that sit within our competence, and where they are within the competence of the British Government. And this will be considered as part of our planning for a non-negotiated outcome. It is vital that we prepare on a collaborative basis with the British Government, given the short time scale available until the end of the transition period. To facilitate that, the British Government has agreed that our officials will be involved in all future meetings of the UK Transition Period Readiness Portfolio Board, and we welcome that development. We also welcome the recent correspondence between the British Government Permanent Secretaries and our NICS counterparts on reciprocal information sharing in relation to operational readiness. That increased engagement with the British Government will go some way to help in aligning our energy and resources to resolve as many issues as possible in the short time scale available and to ensure that we have as sound a risk-informed planning and prioritisation process as possible. We have emphasised to the British Government that it is essential that there is substantial and substantive engagement at both a ministerial and an official level. Ministers will continue to be involved in regular quadrilateral meetings with the Paymaster General Penny Mordaunt and with other devolved administrations from Scotland and Wales, which will consider operational readiness issues. Legislation is also a key area in preparing for both the implementation of the protocol and the future relationship or in the event of a non-negotiated outcome for operational readiness. We have a very significant challenge ahead of us all to effect a high volume of largely technical EU exit legislation before the end of the transition period on 31 December this year. And work is ongoing to capture the volume of legislation which is likely to be required to do that. It will be necessary to manage this alongside the essential mainstream business of the Assembly, including non-EU exit legislative programmes. Our officials are also liaising with Assembly officials to ensure that Assembly committees are involved in a timely and appropriate manner in progressing that legislation. The Executive Office at this time has not identified any legislation to be brought forward under the EU exit legislative programme. The Equality Commission and the Human Rights Commission have been asked by the Treasury to undertake a scrutiny and monitoring role that will form what we have been describing as the dedicated mechanism. And that will ensure that our people are not subject to a diminution on rights, safeguards or equality of opportunity following Britain's exit from the EU. The Executive Office, a sponsor for the Equality Commission, has been involved in discussions that have taken place around appropriate funding for the Commission to discharge that function. And the Commission has formally agreed that it is indeed willing to act as part of the dedicated mechanism and that it will proceed to establish the dedicated mechanism itself. And I touched on that in my, my last report to the Committee. So, Colin, I hope that those updates have been useful for now. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Yes, we appreciate getting that information and thank you for presenting that. Um, I'll begin with uh, so maybe referring. You mentioned a number of times in both presentations about the potential for a non-negotiated outcome or, or no-deal scenario. Could you give us a flavour of the preparation that there is within the Executive Office for a no-deal scenario, given that we're 99 days now, as I understand, from the end of the process, and there is currently no deal and very little prospect of, of a deal given many of the uh, events over the last two weeks. So, I mean, can you give me a flavour? Do you have a special department within the Executive Office that's preparing for a no deal? Do you have a special committee that meets on a regular basis? Who, who's involved in that process and, and what preparations are, are being taken for the disaster of a, a no deal outcome? 
Well, look, I, I do think it is important, first of all, to say that that's not where any of us uh, want to be, and I know that's not where you want to be either. I think it was always going to be the case that negotiations would, would go down to, to, to the wire. I certainly hope that we can get uh, an outcome because that's what's best for, for Northern Ireland to ensure that we, that we have that uh, agreement. Um, we obviously meet regularly. We have the EU Exit Committee that meets um, every week as the, as the executive body that, that's looking at this. And of course, all scenarios are going to be taken into consideration. Uh, we also have the liaison with, um, the, um, with the government uh, in London, um, ensuring that we have um, the most updated information that, that, that we would need uh, as well on, under all of those uh, scenarios. So um, it's not something that we're, we're looking towards. It's not something that we want to see happen. Um, but work, um, obviously, is, is, is going on as, as part of that. OK, if we could just push a bit more on that. I mean, obviously, you know, we had nearly a 15-minute report from yourselves and all the efforts and, and the thousands of people that there must be that are involved in preparing us towards a deal. But it's still only a 50-50 at best outcome. The other side is a no deal. And obviously the implications of a no deal upon businesses and upon communities and upon those that travel uh, back and forward across the border, upon the business that comes in and out through freights. We've heard about all the problems that there is in preparing for a deal. But is there an actual <clears throat> committee? Is there actually a group of people that are actively saying this is what we do if there's a no deal scenario and working sort of wargaming what those solutions would be given that they may be the rules that businesses here have to follow in ninety nine days time? Yeah, sure. Um, there is a, a unit within uh, TEO. Uh, which is headed up by Andrew McCormick, which is specifically responsible uh, on the official side for dealing with negotiations. They participate in the specialised committee. They observe uh, the joint committee meetings. They are engaged directly with British officials on an ongoing basis, uh, and in and around before and after the, uh, the quadrilateral meetings that are convened by Penny Mordaunt. Suffice to say, we are, we are probably now in a perfect storm. Um, our officials are clearly cited on the prospect of there being a no-deal outcome. But even in the event of there being an agreed outcome, we are still some distance away from actually getting clarity and certainty in relation to the issues that are extant. So just to give you a flavour of, uh, of, of, of the pinch points in relation to this, at this particular point in time, there is divergence in the negotiations over rules of origin and in relation to fisheries and state aid. The, the Joint Committee uh, has been uh, mandated to address the issue of, of tariffs uh, before the end of the transition period, the issue of tariffs, fisheries and agriculture, the question of EU representatives uh, in relation to the observation of customs and regulatory inspections, and also exemptions for agricultural state aid. None of those issues have been closed out. It is further complicated by the, the reality, which I touched on in my remarks, that there, there is an interdependency in relation to those outstanding issues of negotiation within how the protocol is going to be implemented. Um, and now the Internal Market Bill brings in huge uh, ramifications for the, the, the current state of process. That is, we have not yet arrived at a point where we can be sure if there is going to be uh, a, an agreed deal. On the other hand, <coughs> the door is open to the prospect of there being a no-deal outcome. At a meeting earlier in September, um, I noted the uh, report given by David Frost. And, and I observed afterwards uh, in meetings with colleagues from Scotland and Wales and the British government that, in fact, what we were hearing were the acoustics for uh, both uh, a crash-out situation and non-crash-out. The difficulty, to come back to points that we have made in the past, is that uh, 
We are not directly involved in the specificity of those negotiations. We press for additional information. We press for information from the British Government in relation to their planning assumptions, both in terms of there being a, a, an outcome, but more importantly in relation to an, a, a, a no, no outcome. And the reason I, I summarised those issues, which are points of divergence where there is a disagreement, and, and they include now state aid, the whole question of the free flow of data, issues in relation to transport, that gives you some sense of the complexity of actually trying to prepare adequately for the prospect of a non-deal outcome. So we are cited on that prospect, but we are only in a position to manage that prospect within our own competence. And at this point in time, and I know it will not satisfy the committee to hear this again, we are still not sufficiently engaged in relation to the detail of the negotiations that would allow the executive and our officials to say that we are sufficiently involved and that we have, we have clarity about the direction of travel in relation to these negotiations. Okay, but again, to make the point, because as you have said, the door is open to a no deal outcome. But I put it to you that if you look into that room, there is no TEO officials in that room preparing for that outcome. And much of what you have said back is about the complexities in preparing for an outcome. And I'm hearing what you're saying that our um, engagement um, isn't to the highest standards in terms of preparing for an outcome. But surely somebody, somewhere within the executive office, has said there's a fairly high chance here that we could have a no deal outcome, and we know what the ramifications are. We'd have known two years ago what the ramifications of a no deal outcome would be. So has anybody within the executive office said, do you know what, can we put a few people in their room and start sketching out what would be required for a no deal scenario so that we can help people prepare for that? I would just say I think it's unfair to say that, there's, that there is nobody um, that is dealing with this, and if that's the impression that we've given you, that, that's wrong. Um, first of all, because we do look at all of these scenarios, and obviously then there are officials that will look at the, the non-negotiated outcome scenario as well. Additionally, there was an awful lot of, done, a lot, an awful lot of work done a year ago um, in anticipation for the possibility of no agreement at the end of 2019. Uh, the hub was established that was dealing with that within the, um, within the wider civil service. That has the ability to be stood up uh, again uh, when necessary. So uh, I don't have maybe some of the specific detail that you're looking for, um, Mr Chairman, but if I can get that to you, I'd, I'd be more than happy to pass that on. Well, look, I think we have officials coming next week that are going to give us a presentation about contingency planning, which will include for a, a no-deal scenario. Can, can I suggest that you suggest to them that they're well versed and well ready to give us answers on on those preparations, that, and that would be, be very useful. Um, ministers, the Future EU Relations Committee in Westminster has been meeting with the. Uh, devolved regions to listen to the issues that they're having with Brexit and to take on board their views. Um, I understand both Scotland and England, or sorry, Scotland and Wales, met with that committee in Westminster on the 15th of September. Now, the executive office was invited, but I understand that you haven't responded yet to that invitation. Um, it's an open invitation, as I understand them as well. Would it be your intention, given that the other devolved regions have have? Sort of accepted the invitation in good spirit and went along to discuss the issues. Would there be any opportunity for the views of the executive to be relayed at those? So, certainly, have no objection uh, to that, Mr. Chairman. Happy to share our, our experience in engaging with um, uh, with the government on this issue, this issue. No problem at all. Okay. Well, I think you have an invite within the department that that was. I think the aim was they were looking to have the three devolved regions there at the one meeting, but the impression seems to be that there's a a difficulty securing an answer from yourselves. I, th I think that would be incredibly important, but we've missed the boat in the three regions coming together to give that, but I'm sure they would I'm sure, meet with the, yourselves if you were able to, to get uh, to that invite. And they would be very clear, Colin, on the message that we'd be bringing, because there's a regular continuous engagement uh, mm -hmm. on a quadrilateral basis uh, between ourselves, our Scottish and our Welsh colleagues along with specifically the mechanism that is in place with Penny Mordaunt, and then separate to that an increased uptake in relation to engagement with Michael Gove and his people through the JMC itself.
As a good custodian of select committees and, and, and committees that are in legislators, I think if they were looking at an opportunity to meet with you, it would, have been, it would be nice for them to be able to get a flavour of what your thinking is to help inform their work uh, in putting pressure um, on, on the government as well. Um, finally, then, um, you have maybe got some more additional time on your hands now that you have passed the responsibility for health regulations on uh, and the, the amendments to, that, that you would have taken responsibility for passage through the House has now gone to the Health Minister. So, could we get a flavour, maybe just from yourselves, what your priorities are as junior ministers in, in terms of Brexit? Where do you see the most important work being in the, in the 99 days ahead? What are the, the key areas that you are working towards? Well, just let me say first, in terms of the health regulations, uh, we were happy to take those through the Assembly on behalf of the Health Minister. They were obviously health regulations, but the Executive, and we were happy to step in at that time and to, to help the Health Minister uh, in that way. Um, we've got to the stage now where um, there's an increasing uh, workload, especially on officials within our department, and uh, it's made it necessary um, for our officials to concentrate on, on, on that other. <coughs> Certainly, as far as we are concerned, Brexit is not the only issue that we deal with, um, but certainly I would say the, the majority of the time that we would spend on, on Brexit-related issues would be in regards to engagement um, with, the, um, with, with, the, with the UK government. Um, mm -hmm. We do that regularly. Um, we meet, as Declan has already outlined, um, in, in a number of formats, and we will continue to do that. We also had the opportunity last week um, to meet with the EU ambassador to the to the UK, and you know we're not direct participants uh, within these negotiations. Although we do have the ability, and we have gone along to joint committee meetings. But really, I see it um, certainly as my role, um, and, and I, I, I think Declan will share this as well. Look, we have a common purpose here, which is to secure the best outcome that we can for Northern Ireland. We understand the issues that are at play here, and we want to make sure that those who are negotiating are aware of our special circumstances that we are facing as a result of the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. So we want to make sure that the views of the people here in Northern Ireland are heard. We do that through engaging both with the government uh, and, where appropriate, with, with the EU, and that is what we are going to continue to do. I am sure Declan will want to add some. Yes, and uh, add to that also, in terms of engagements that were appropriate with the Irish government uh, and uh, in the context of north-south engagements, uh, our objective clearly is to find an agreed outcome to uh, this negotiation, um, to, the, uh, to the, the conclusion of the withdrawal agreement itself, that it will be fully implemented. That is our objective. But it is out with our competence, our authority, to ensure that that happens. Uh, I think that we are dealing with a, a, a British government at this point in time that has probably set itself on a trajectory uh, to see uh, an, a non-agreed outcome, a crash-out Brexit. Uh, and in those circumstances, our function, our job, must be to then ensure that uh, the uh, protocol which will still come into force on the 1st of, of January 2021, is in fact fully implemented, and that the interests of our people, deal or no deal, continue to be protected, both in terms of the economy, businesses, and the livelihoods of citizens who live here. So, in terms of the bigger picture, those are the guiding objectives that uh, we will be responsible for taking forward, both directly on behalf of the executive and then deputising where appropriate on behalf of the joint heads of government. And Minister Kearney, I, I, I could not agree with you more. I, I think that sense of moving towards uh, a, a no-deal outcome, um, I am not entirely comforted by the answers that I have had from you, but I hope that that is maybe from being put on the spot rather than and not having the detail. But hopefully next week we will extract much more detail about the preparations that this executive is making for that outcome, because if it is a reality, what we do not want on the 1st or 2nd of January is the accusation that the executive was asleep at the wheel, too busy focusing on another outcome and not preparing for the one that could be hurtling towards us, because that would be certainly where we do not want to go. That would certainly be a very unfortunate outcome, because it would, re it would reflect very badly on all five parties who are members of our power sharing coalition. And the British Government. Of course. I pass the vice oh, sorry. And the EU. And the EU. I pass to the vice chair. Thanks, chair uh, Gordon Declan. Thank you um, for that brief. Um, it's really informative, and, and and thank you for all of the work you're, you're thank you for all of the work that you're doing in regards to um, 
to this. It's, it's complex. It's high-end politics. It's international politics. Um, uh, and as you said, um, we are not sufficiently uh, involved in that. Um, for whatever reasons, uh, I, I don't know. And, and I've got a real concern that what we have uh, is a game of football between Boris and Barnier, uh, and Northern Ireland happens to be the football. And the concern is uh, that somebody's going to push that nuclear button, uh, and there's going to be a non-negotiated outcome. And I've got to say this, because uh, it has to be on the record, I'm staggered that we do not have something somewhere, a committee of people whose sole purpose is to look at what a non-negotiated outcome will mean for us. Because even, Declan, if I, if I take your own words, uh, as you've said, that you believe the British Government are intent on a non-negotiated outcome. So if we believe that they're intent on that, why are we not preparing for that? So, so I, I, I've got to say I, I, I am concerned. That we don't. I honestly thought you would sit there and say, "Yes, no problem." We've set a department aside, and they're looking at all of the upshot of what a non-negotiated um, outcome would be. So, I, I've, I've got to say, in echoing the chair's point, I, I am concerned. I hope you can take that back to the executive office and say that we have a concern. No, sorry, sorry. No, no. Sorry, I just think it's important for me to come in on this point. And sorry, before I do, actually, um, can I just say, Doug, to you personally, um, I'm very disappointed to hear about the, the threat um, that has been levelled against you. That's completely unacceptable and needs to be um, condemned by, by all right-thinking people. And I just didn't want to let this opportunity go without, without saying that. I do think, though, it is important just to clarify. I don't, I don't want any misinformation going out of here uh, today. It's not the case um, that nothing is going on around this issue. I've already said this is an issue that is raised during um, – it's, it's on our – our dashboard, the, the problems, uh, the potential issues that we could face. Um, officials within the department have been dealing with this, this issue and the possibility of, first of all, a no deal uh, at the end of 2019 and now, what we may face at the end of, of, of 2020. I don't want to give the wrong impression here today that in any way this isn't being considered as an option and appropriate steps aren't being taken. Uh, I don't have the number of people. Um, I don't have the um, further detail or data on that, but we are happy to, to give that uh, to you, and no doubt the officials will be able to fill you in further on that. Uh, and, and Gordon, can, can I just follow up on that, and, and thank you for, for your kind words, first of all, um, but can I just follow up on that, and, and I don't want you to think that I don't think you are working on that either, because I, I think you are, I, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is I honestly thought there would be a de dedicated group, uh, which would be cr cross-departmental. You know, so that justice will be looking at what happens if there isn't negotiated. Health will be looking at it. Um, infrastructure will be looking at it. That's what I honestly thought we would be at now, especially since the internal market bill has made everything so incredibly toxic, and we think that we are going to a non-negotiated outcome. So, uh, my deduction on that, and my analysis on that, is as soon as somebody says that to me, I would be ramping up my preparations for a non-negotiated outcome, and that would include some form of a committee, some form of a working group, cross-departmental to look at uh, all of those issues. So I'm not saying you aren't working on it, Gordon, and please, I don't think I, I meant that. I'm just saying I, I thought we would have been ramping up um, uh, what, what we would be doing. Uh, what, I can, what I can tell you just on that point, yep. Doug, is that uh, in the aftermath of the civil contingencies structure being stood down, at an earlier stage, as we dealt with the uh, <coughs> need to deal with the, uh, the health crisis, uh, a, a process, a review process, was undertaken in relation to that structure. Its specific uh, forward focus was on repurposing a structure based upon the civil contingencies model for the Brexit scenario. Whether that scenario was in context with a deal or the prospect of there being no deal. Uh, that review has been carried out. The report, I presume, has been, is in the process of being drafted. It has not been brought forward yet, but it was about uh, two broad objectives, uh, assessing what worked within civil contingencies as we dealt with the complexity of the, uh, the health crisis, and then what would be effective learning to be uh, introduced to a new structure that would be cross-departmental, that would be interagency, to deal with the repercussions and the headwinds of whatever lies on the other side of the uh, transition period. 
and, and thanks, Dick. And interesting, it'll be interesting to see that because yeah. when we didn't have an assembly here, there was also a civil contingency looking at a no deal Brexit. So, the, so actually, what we had looking at a no deal Brexit can nearly be transposed to looking at a non negotiated. Yes. You know, it'd be interesting to see that report, I have to say, um, and, and as time ticks on quite rapidly, you know, it would be really good to see that. Well, arising from this discussion, I actually will go back to those who were responsible for overseeing the process, who carried out the interviews, who gathered the information, the data, and, and I will inquire for you yeah. uh, as to where the drafting of that report is at, because uh, it, its forward focus was on uh, the Brexit situation. And, and you can see that, that there's a real concern here. I mean, I'm, I'm really I'm concerned. It's not a blame, it's a concern. Um, <coughs> because to, to say that they're gathering up all of the exit le legislation that needs to be achieved before we, the, the transition period is over. Yet Northern Ireland hasn't identified any exit, exit legislation, nothing at all, nothing in, in the executive office, nothing in justice, nothing in health, nothing in infrastructure. We've identified no legislation that we have to amend before. Is that is that? Is that what we're saying? No, no. There, um, there are three pieces of legislation oh, that, so have been, that have been identified at this stage. Okay, sorry. So that would be an education bill, the health and social care cross-border health care bill, and the infrastructure omnibus bill. So those are three indicative, uh, well, <coughs> an indicative requirement for those three bills to be brought forward to be completed uh, during or shortly. Uh, afterwards as possible of the EU transition period. And in addition to that, um, Stormont departments believe that there are 72 Assembly SRs, 13 of which have been laid, and 90 Westminster SIs, 21 of which have been laid, and nine Westminster primary legislation, uh, primary, uh, primary bills. So um, though it's not that those haven't been identified. They, they certainly have. There may well be more that are to be identified. And, and, and will they be? Sorry, will they be the responsibility of of this assembly to to work through these before the end of of the year? Is that is that that's a chunky old bit of work, or isn't it? It is, and, uh, and and it's a very daunting prospect to expect that it will be done by the thirty first of December. It's a very very challenging uh, workload that that faces us. In the midst of all of the uncertainty. Yeah, and and, and, and could I ask very, very briefly? Um, thanks for your indulgence, Chair. Can can I just ask very briefly? I take it that there's no issue with some of this legislation happens after the transition period is over. We don't suddenly stop dead on the, the 31st of December. There is stuff that can that can follow up. I think it's inevitable that there's going to be yeah. a carryover into 2021, Doug. That's unavoidable. So we as a so we as an assembly and as an executive will still be doing. Brexit in 2021 is. We'd be dealing with the consequences of it, whatever arises. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Thank, okay. thank you, um, and thank you, Chair. Bettina. Uh, thank you, thank you, ministers, for for your presentation and a few questions, uh, Minister mm -hmm. Hines. I come to you first. Okay. That's okay. Yep. But I asked you if um, the executive will be taking account of the two motions that went through the assembly uh, that were passed. Mm -hmm overwhelmingly Monday and Tuesday um, on upholding the protocol and rejecting the internal market bill? Well, um, obviously there is a difference of opinion within the executive office um, around the internal market bill. Look, there are things that we're obviously united on. We obviously want to make sure that we can get the best outcome for Northern Ireland. We don't want to see any additional barriers to trade north-south or to east-west. And we are united on getting the best outcome uh, for people here in Northern Ireland. Obviously, though, there is a difference of opinion uh, in regards to the Internal Market Bill, and I think that that was, was expressed um, in, the, in, in the debate. So that's our starting point, um, uh, Ms Anderson. We want to make sure that we're, that we're going to get the, uh, the, the best deal here for people in Northern Ireland. Um, Mr Minister Kearney, um, picking up on that, could you give us your blunt and honest analysis of the internal market bill? There's no good Brexit, um, regardless of the outcome. Um, as Gordon said, we, we, we have political differences in relation to leave and remain, but we are, in fact, united in relation to what's necessary to protect our economy, jobs, the livelihoods of citizens. Um, we, we, we did have the option of an extension 
uh, despite uh, representations from some of the parties here in relation to an extension being secured in June. Um, the, the British government refused to, to ask for that. Um, my own sense is that the British government at this point in time with the introduction of the Internal Market Bill is probably uh, pressing one of the, uh, the EU's most sensitive buttons. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, it foresees the prospect of a post-Brexit Britain um, potentially becoming more agile, the regulated free market uh, competitor, and with access to EU markets um, by using selective uh, state aid. So th there has been much punditry around the way this is shaping up. Some have talked about uh, a game of chicken, um, a standoff between the British government and the EU. Um, the British government has said emphatically that they are not going to blink. They said before that they were not going to proceed with an application for extension. They have said that they will not blink and uh, that the EU does not actually grasp the gravity of that intent. And, uh, and, I, and I think that that is what leads me to the consideration that we may well be dealing with elements, at least within this British government, that have the whip hand, who are prepared for a non uh, a non deal, uh, an, a non uh, negotiated outcome. And, and he, Boris Johnson has said that if there is nothing sorted out by the 15th of October, then nothing is going to be sorted out at all, because the clock is now ticking towards the 31st of, of October. Leaving the, uh, the EU on the 31st of December uh, without a deal, in my view, is going to have serious repercussions for jobs and for the local economy. Uh, I think that will be both regional and it will be for the island economy itself. I also happen to think that, uh, and, and I was reading a report on this this morning um, by a, a study carried out under the auspices of the London School of Economics, that there could be serious repercussions for the economy in the British state itself. So that's why I say there is no good Brexit for any of us, regardless of how you come at this. Uh, remain or leave. But I do believe that the legislation itself is, uh, is, a, is a very clear breach of international law. The Secretary of State indicated as much in, in his remarks, acknowledged that it does represent a departure from an international treaty, that it is a breach. Um, and while some might say that the approach of the bill is nothing more than a negotiation ploy in itself to try and exert some additional uh, leverage uh, and to squeeze Michel Barnier's approach in, in all of this. The reality is that it has provoked a, a huge outcry uh, here in, in this state. It has a, a provoked a huge outcry on the island. Uh, the reaction from the United States, with people like Nancy Pelosi and Richie Neal stating that if there is uh, no deal and there is a threat to the Good Friday Agreement, as a consequence, there will be no British-US free trade treaty uh, struck. And, and then it's notable to uh, take up on the fact that elements within the British establishment, and in fact within the Tory Party itself, have come out very, very forcefully to say. This is a breach of uh, international law. It has huge reputational damage for the British government, for the British state, and it should never have, uh, have happened. Our colleagues in Scotland and Wales are describing it effectively as a full frontal assault on devolution, as a power grab. If, if you look at uh, elements of the, uh, the bill, such as Clause 49, when you, when you drill down into it, uh, it actually provides for amendments to our own 1998 Bill Act here in the North, the legislative basis of the Good Friday Agreement, and it also has implications for other devolved regions' statutes. And, and that effectively then creates a situation where the Internal Market Act would be firewalled away from any future amendment or judicial challenge. Now, that's, that's a pretty stark and worrying situation. Uh, so, uh, in, 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 in short, um, I'm, I do have a view that the uh, protocol itself 
is, is imperfect. It is not the finished article. Uh, but it is at least an insurance policy that gives us basic protections in relation to our peace agreement for political stability here, for the rights of citizens, for the island economy and for the protection of jobs and livelihoods uh, of our citizens here. But it has repercussions for the Good Friday Agreement, to be, to be blunt in response to your point. And I do think that this is dangerous ground for the British Government to consider abandoning those safeguards and mitigations, whether or not it is a, a negotiation tactic. It is dangerous ground to get into when you start to, to mess with that level of political sensitivity and, uh, and, and, uh, and stability. Um, I believe that Boris Johnson and, and some within his government have been negligent in their approach to the Good Friday Agreement. That has been a hallmark of every Tory government since 2010 negligence towards the agreement, oversight for the agreement. I think that the British government, to, to go back to something that Doug said earlier on, I actually think that uh, this British government is now treating the North uh, and the peace process and our power share and agree, uh, arrangements here as a commodity in a bigger picture. I think that that is wrong. And what is really now at stake, to conclude, what is at stake in all of this is the political and the economic progress that we have enjoyed here. Uh, on this island, in this region, and uh, in terms of how it has improved relations between Britain and Ireland. I think all of that is potentially up in the air as a result of what has happened here. And I suppose, Mr Chairman, to answer that question, um, I take a very uh, different view on the Internal Markets Bill. I actually believe that it is a step forward. Uh, I believe that it actually uh, tries to, I think, first of all, recognise some of the damage that has been done by the withdrawal agreement and the protocol. Um, I don't believe it's everything <coughs> that we need, but I believe that it is a step forward um, compared to, to where we were previously. Because we all sit here and we all talk about how we want to make sure um, there are no uh, issues north-south or, or east-west. Um, but we don't have that certainly yet in terms of uh, east-west. We need to, to make sure, considering that the rest of the UK is our biggest market, we need to make sure that there can be that free flow. Um, we need to make sure that we can deal with issues such as the uh, export declarations. Um, we need to make sure that we can move our goods um, to, to the rest of the UK. I, I don't believe that that is a problem um, in terms of the command paper and what has already been set out. And in fact, um, it is keeping. Uh, it is in keeping with what. Um, the EU and others have already said that their uh, objectives are. Um, I think people have got themselves very excited about this bill, and we've heard an awful lot of scaremongering out there uh, about how it affects the Good Friday Agreement. And I just want to put on record today that I think that, that it's absolutely wrong for people to do that. And I'm fed up of Northern Ireland being used um, as a pawn in all of the European negotiations, but it's been made worse um, by some. Uh, in, in regards to what they have said about the Good Friday Agreement, how it damages the Good Friday Agreement. I actually have a copy of the Good Friday Agreement here. My own copy, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I, I lent my own copy to the former Secretary of State, uh, Julian Smith, during the talks process, and unfortunately he never gave it back to me. Um, so next time he's here, maybe we could uh, ask him about that. He must but be rereading it and enjoying it. He, he, he must be, and, and, <laughs> I, and I, that's, that's a positive move from British Secretary of State. And, and, I, and I, I've been reading it uh, as well, and it says that it would be wrong to make any change in the status of Northern Ireland, save with the consent of a majority of its people. And I believe that that's what the protocol does. Um, uh, it's the protocol that goes against um, uh, the Good Friday uh, Agreement, not the Internal Markets Bill. In fact, what I think that the, what the Internal Markets Bill is trying to do uh, is support what we find in Article 6 of the, of the Act of Union, which is that free flow um, of, of goods and of trade between um, Northern Ireland and the, and, and the rest of the, of the UK. So we've all committed um, to making sure we have this um, f uh, free, move, free movement, um, north, south and, uh, and east, west. So uh, what I think we need to do is take the heat uh, out of all of this, take the hyperbole out of it all, and actually try and work together <coughs> to get a deal uh, that delivers for the people that we represent. Well, Chair, you will not be surprised uh, to hear me say that, that I do not concur uh, with that analysis, because the section that has just been read out from the Good Friday <coughs> Agreement 
is the section that deals with the constitutional question, and that was the only area of the consent, uh, the area of the principle of the consent was to apply. I think given that a lot of people, um, many in the international community, do regard the Internal Market Bill as putting us on, as the Minister has said, Minister Kearney, on dangerous ground, I think the step forward that you're talking about is taking us towards that cliff. And in 99 days' time, we are in danger of going over a cliff. And whatever plans you're looking for, Chair, I don't know how you plan for taking yourself out of the rubble, because that's what we're facing into. And this isn't scaremongering. You know, we've heard and been dismissed about all of that as we were heading out uh, campaigning to remain in the EU. We were dismissed and told we were scaremongering. And unfortunately, Project Fear, as we were accused of, became Project Fact. So as we take in uh, what's been said about the dangerous territory that we're on and where we're heading towards, could I ask, uh, Minister Kearney, you had spoke about the Border Controls post and you mentioned procurement um, briefly uh, in your commentary. So could, given what has taken place from Minister Putz um, in relation to the implementation of the border control post, could you give us a further update as to where the implementation of the protocol or the procurement story is in relation to the border control post? Yeah, well, well, briefly, the, the executive has discussed the issue at length. <coughs> uh, the procurement process has commenced in relation to putting in place whatever infrastructure is required in fulfilment of the obligations flowing from the protocol. So that's gone. Yeah, again, I feel that we're getting things the, the, the wrong way round. Um, you know, as part of the negotiations, what we should have done first was got the free trade agreement in place and, and then worked on the withdrawal agreement. Uh, and I think it's the same when it comes to uh, what, what's taken place. Uh, here, um, it's obviously right that we try and uh, and get that agreement first, and this is why it's so this is why it's so difficult for us to to, to legislate. Why it's so difficult um, for us to um, do some of the things that we might need to do, because we don't we don't have an agreement yet. We don't know what what an agreement is going uh, to to look like. Um, we don't know what type of checks, if, if any, are, are, are going to be needed. So I think we just need to be um, very careful uh, in terms of how we, we proceed um, uh, on that issue. Uh, and just then to go back to, to the previous point that you, you had made about the, the, the Good Friday Agreement, um, I'm not a supporter or a defender um, of the Good Friday uh, Agreement. I think uh, my party's position on that is clear. But I would read to you the words of, of David uh, Trimble, who had uh, something to do with that agreement when he said that the amazing and disturbing fact is that the withdrawal agreement, and in particular the Northern Ireland Protocol, totally undermine the central premise of the Good Friday Agreement. The whole purpose of the agreement was to give stability to Northern Ireland by embedding in this international accord a promise that it was up to the people of Northern Ireland to choose the constitutional status of the country. So I would just urge uh, people to be very careful uh, in regards to uh, their language. I recognise that there's a difference of opinion in Northern Ireland on Brexit. I respect the fact that different people have taken uh, a different view in regards uh, to this. Um, what I'm calling for is that we try to ensure um, that, that we do respect um, the, the constitutional status of this country, as all uh, parties in here um, uh, have agreed to, and I think that's very important as we, as we move forward. But I, I'm sure, Mr Chairman, you're not wanting to, to go any further uh, on this at this time, but I thought it was important to put that on the record. And of course, the constitutional question is laid out in the Good Friday Agreement and it can be tested. Let's test it if everyone thinks that it's okay, if it's safe, and let's see, we'd let the people decide, but that's for, yep, another, needs the consent of the people. for another day. Well, if, um, if I may just come in, so that we've got a bit of balance in relation to how we're receiving or filtering the issue of people's reaction to what has happened. Um, the Lord Chief Justice... Uh, Declan Morgan stated er earlier uh, in the last few days that such a flagrant disregard for the rule of law will no doubt engender a quote-unquote domestic effect on the confidence that the public will have in our regional legal system. So there are many people who are commenting on the repercussions of this. I don't think that they are all coming at this from an ideological or from a partisan political perspective. And uh, in recent days, 
uh, a very significant consortium of civil society groups within the North, including the Committee on the Administration of Justice, uh, have warned that the uh, implementation of the Internal Market Act will have repercussions and consequences for the basis upon which our political process is established. And, and I think we have to take account of all of those views, notwithstanding the differences that, that we have uh, as parties in relation to this situation. There is a bigger picture here, and I think that it would be foolhardy for us just to dismiss criticism of the Internal Market Bill potentially to become an Internal Market Act as simply being sabre-rattling or partisan or, or critical for the sake of being critical. And, and, and let's bear in mind, uh, this has been in the making now since 2018. Boris Johnson picked up on a negotiation that was closed out by Theresa May. There is very little substantive material difference between what was in her original backstop and what is now what you might describe as being in his front stop. But you know, once he's seen the, uh, the, 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 the ink dry in the paper, he's effectively now stepping back and saying, no, listen, boss, I'm not up for that anymore. So you, know, you, uh, you, 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 can't, you can't take a pick-and-mix approach towards how you conduct international negotiations. Uh, you're either in for a penny or you're in for a pound. And the British government, this British government, is down this road two years and signed up to this. And I don't accept for a moment that Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, and others within that administration didn't know what they were signing on for. Um, Chair, I think it's important that maybe we would all realise you can't have a future relationship before you get a divorce. You can't say to somebody, I'm not going to divorce you unless you tell me what way you're going to treat me in the future. And that's what this was about. The withdrawal agreement was your divorce, and your future relationship is what you do afterwards. So you can't be saying, well, we should have had the future relationship sorted out first, and then we would work out how we're going to divorce one another. So I think what you've described there is, is, is the wrong way around. But what I'm concerned about also, we've heard a lot of talk, and we all are involved, and of course we're concerned about the custom union and the internal market, and whether it's the internal market bill and analysis of that. And we have cows and we have sheep and we have pigs across from one end of the border and you know, produced in one and processed of an, in another. And we hear about all of those protections, but it's a non-diminution of rights. Um, it's, that's something that I think that we need to hear. How is the executive going to um, collectively ensure that that clause in the protocol, that there be no diminution of rights, given that we live in a place that won't even have a single equality bill, won't even have a bill of rights, and how are we going to protect, for instance, those people who live in your constituency and mine? I thought you wanted a divorce this first. Island Order. And across this island. Martin, I thought you wanted a divorce first. And Order. For instance, I'm asking the, a question. But I thought you wanted a divorce first. Make your mind up what you want. So, who, asks, who cross this island, for instance, even in your own constituency? Oh, what was the divorce you wanted? Get the divorce done. Blind Take your own words. And is dependent on a dog. And a, a dog. That maybe they, they work in one part of this jurisdiction uh, and, and they live in another. So, for instance, if they're crossing, if they're in Straban and they have to cross the bridge, every time they cross the bridge, if you're talking about these rights not being upheld and protected and that there would be a diminution of our rights, they're going to have to go to the FET. And they're going to have to ensure that every time they cross from one side of this border to the, or, or the other, that the dog is checked by the FET and paid for by the FET to make sure it doesn't have rabies. Those people who need disability rights upheld in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, that has been scrapped already. We know we've lost the Charter of Fundamental Rights that upholds the rights of people who are disabled. So just as has been said, there's no good outcome for anyone. There's no good outcome for people in your constituency, as there are, there's no good outcome, I believe, for people in my own constituency. But I am concerned about our hard-won rights. And last week we had the Equality Commission and we had the um, Human Rights Commissions in front of us. And of course, they have got a mechanism, this dedicated mechanism, all this jargon that can confuse people, but they have to watch that to ensure there would be no diminution of rights in the event of us going over a cliff. So what happens to our hard-won rights? So, so I suppose, first of all, a, a number of issues. Um, 
to reply to your comments. First of all, it was the EU that set preconditions. They wanted the divorce bill sorted out first. They wanted citizens' rights sorted out, and they wanted the uh, um, border issue in Northern Ireland sorted out first. Um, I completely, completely disagree with you um, that it would have been wrong for us to have sorted out the free trade agreement first, because the free trade agreement, you would know what the future relationship would be like, so you would know then how um, the UK would, would disengage from the U European Union. Secondly, uh, in terms of what my constituents want, um, my constituents voted for Brexit. I think they would take a very different view from yourself uh, on that. Um, if you would like to test that, if you would like to stand the election um, in East Antrim, then that, that would be, be up, for you, uh, up to you. Uh, Declan has actually already set out where we are in terms of rights, um, the dedicated mechanism that has been put in place. But again, this will take goodwill on, a, on all sides. Some of the issues um, that you have already um, commented on there, made reference to, um, can be sorted out. And, 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 and the, the, the dog example that you gave and, um, and whatever else uh, it may Blind be. Dogs. Sorry? Blind dogs, for people who are blind. Yes, absolutely. The, the, there's very no, important. There's, there's no, uh, very, very important. And there's no reason why those issues can't be sorted out. We want to see that. We want to make sure that that's going to happen. That's why TO is the sponsor for ECNI, has been involved in, in discussions around uh, rights with the Equality uh, with the Human Rights Commission uh, as well. So I don't see why um, that, that needs to be a problem or a, or a sticking block. Well, Chair, I would just say it's probably a lack of understanding of Article 50 of the EU because that says you can take account of but you can't set the future relationship. So Article 50 was quite clear. It's EU law. I know that people aren't really now supporting upholding international law, but it was international law. Uh, Article 50, if you were leaving the EU, then you have a withdrawal agreement and then <coughs> discuss the future relationship. That's set in law. But I suppose we're in a territory now, or a moment in time, where people aren't really upholding or supporting upholding international. Well, you know, I would just like to say I I, I think that um, the <coughs> member has sh has shown a complete lack of self awareness when he talks about <coughs> upholding uh, the law. Um, because it was the member who was a member of an illegal organisation. It was the member who had served time uh, in prison. Uh, it was the member who, not more than a few months ago, found herself in the position where she was breaking regulations that this assembly and this executive uh, has set. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to have the debate uh, in terms of international law. But I think it's hypocritical uh, of the member um, to, to, to come to. Uh, I, I understand oh, testing your patience, yeah, but, point Chair, but that Chair, issue. I need to be able to respond to that because we all have come from a past. In a war, it's a terrible thing. It's how you get out of it and how you build conflict to resolution. And I would say to yourself that this is about how we discuss sharing a different Ireland going forward. Of course, look. We can all talk about incidents of what happened in the past. And if that's the conversation we want to have, then the Chair, I'm sure, will facilitate that. But we are now talking about the future. And that's what I'm talking about. And that's what I have worked every day since I have been released from jail to make this place a better place so that no one either feels that they have to make a decision and choices that I made. So let's move away from that. And let's work together to build that better future. Certainly for all the talk of divorce, it feels like a certain amount of relationship counselling has been going on between the three of you as part of that section. But I'm going to move on because we actually are into our next uh, evidence session at this time, time-wise. But we have Trevor that would like to ask some questions. Uh, thanks, Chair. And, uh, thanks, gentlemen, for your presentations. Hardly uplifting, but at least it was interesting. Um, just on what you've just been talking about, and I, I don't get involved in these things, because I, I take the view since I came here in 2007 that everybody around this table is here for the same reason, because they got voted. They got the mandate from their electorate, and they got voted into position here. Frankly, within, within reason, what has happened in the distant past doesn't, it's not really relevant anymore here. We need to move on. I, I totally agree with what Martina said. The, having said that, is it fair to say that the, the uh, uh, Internal Markets Act won't, won't come into force until we know whether or not we're going out of Europe on a no deal or non negotiated or crash out, whatever you want to call it? At the, 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 it's, it's cart before horse. The, the, we will know by the 15th of October, I think, from what you said, that whether it's Britain's intention, which it clearly is, to. to 
drag out the negotiations to the point where he can say, no, we're, we're getting nowhere, we're just going to crash out and make our own arrangements. Now, would that, would that then make the Internal Markets Bill or Act uh, irrelevant? Because if Britain's going its own way, it can make its own rules within reason. And the, th the things that are in the Internal Markets Bill at the moment, that at least more than half of us disagree with, and so does civil society. But they, they, they wouldn't be necessary. I mean, it, and also in terms of the internal markets bill, <coughs> does the do, do the devolved administrations have to agree to this? I see, I see a letter in our papers here from the Welsh government asking that question, and also. I mean, not a fair question for you guys, perhaps, but is, is it a fact that the, the House of Lords, because this bill wasn't in the Conservative manifesto, could actually block it? There you are. Right. Okay. Uh, where to start with um, with, with all of those those questions? Um, well, obviously, I think that what the government have said is that this bill is to try and create a, a safety net. Um, in the event that there isn't uh, an agreement, in the event that the protocol um, isn't implement, implemented in such a way that, that, that protects us, um, th these um, these provisions will 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 come into force. Um, so that's obviously meant as a, a safety net, that type of a a, 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 a mechanism um, to to ensure that that is uh, protected. I'll, I'll share with you, Trevor, um, a quote from the. Uh, House of Lords Constitution Committee, which is written to Boris Johnson, um, Michael Gove, Dominic Raab, British Attorney General, and Robert Buckland, and it has said that the Internal Market Bill proposes to confer ministerial powers that conflict with international law, the Ministerial Code, and the Cabinet Manual in Britain, and uh, it cites in its letter, quote. The Internal Market Bill puts the entire withdrawal agreement and other related agreements at risk, potentially unravelling the policy of the Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020, and this would have far-reaching consequences. So that's coming from within the, the British House of Lords. Yes. Well, does it give any clue as to whether they actually think that it, it could be blocked? It would be unprecedented, but could it be blocked by the House of Lords? But it, it gives no clue. Uh, I'm, I'm just sharing that, that quotation uh, with right. you because I, I said earlier in my remarks that uh, I, I think that there are differences of opinion uh, within the British political system, within the Tory party itself, within the, the British House of Lords. Uh, but is there sufficient critical mass within all of that opposition and concern to then bring forward a, a block to the legislation? I don't know. I don't have a crystal yeah, ball. And, uh, and it, it, it's, it's fairly obvious. What, I mean, if, if there is a crash out, that irrespective of whether we have an internal market bill or not, the effect straight away the effect will be on the north-south border. It has to be. I mean, Europe, Europe will not take this lying down. And there, there's a clear contradiction of our Good Friday Agreement and all the other agreements we have over the years that they uh, free free access to and fro across that border. That that will become a European border, and that this is outrageous. What's going on? I, I, I know I, I've been predicting here for so, some months, as you know, it, that we're inevitably we're going to get to this point. That was before I ever heard of the internal market bill, but it's getting worse. And on the back of what uh, Jaron and Doug asked uh, as, as regards preparations, I, I don't see any evidence. Not, not that I would be privy to the sort of information you're privy to. I see no evidence whatsoever of any serious preparations for what is not now an inevitable no deal Brexit. It's just not, not happening. It may be, now, let's, let's be fair, at our local level perhaps. I think, you, I think you did indicate there was some preparations going on. But what about national level, where it really matters? We, we are now, we're, we're entirely in the hands of the national government here. Where people have talked about this Northern Ireland being a pawn in the game. Absolutely, that's what we are. Boris Johnson and the, his Tory government doesn't—they're they're not really interested. We're, we're a side issue and all this. I don't think they care much about the Good Friday Agreement. 
which your party never signed, Gordon Fairnuff, and uh, and they're just relying on the majority to get through whatever they like and the, hang the consequences. They they actually think that they can still develop in these circumstances despite the warnings and the damage their international reputation as a result of what they're doing now, that they can still strike a trade deal with anybody they like. And what have they got so far? A, a tiny increase in what's available from Japan, which is not as good as what the EU has, and probably some was San Marino, I don't know, God knows where it is. And, uh, I'm sorry, I'm ranting. No, that's okay. Maybe I could come in and answer some yeah. of those uh, yeah. questions for you. So, first of all, on the House of Lords issue, um, my understanding is yes, it could ping back and forward, forward between the Commons and the Lords. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on the legislatures, but <coughs> that could um, uh, bounce back and, and forward in, in, in that regard. Um, in terms of um, north-south trade, the UK government have made it clear they're not going to be putting in any infrastructure in, in the border. So that'll obviously be. Well, the, the, the pressure for a border control on the Irish border. Well, that'll will be come up to the EU. That'll be up to the to, to the European yeah, Union. It still, uh, it still happens as a result of the activities of our government. Well, I, I'm still hoping that there will be there will be goodwill on all sides so that we can prevent mm. that from from happening. I could see that. And, <laughs> yeah. Um, the other issue then, just on preparedness. Yes, there is. Um, TO does the executive office does oversee um, cross departmental wo working in, in terms of. Um, possibility of a non-negotiated outcome, and like I've already said to, to the Chairman and to Mr Beatty, we will endeavour to get you more information on that, and the committee will obviously be furnished with that information uh, next week whenever the, the officials come as well. Okay. I, I, under, I understand where you're, 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 you're coming from. There's, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, around here at this moment in time. I'm hoping that an agreement can be found, we can have a trade deal uh, in place so that we can do away with a lot of these problems. I'll, I'll finish there, Chair, but I'm going to say I would be interested to see the expression on Her Majesty the Queen's face if she has been asked to sign a bill into law which is clearly in breach of international law. That would be an interesting picture to have. I know she can't refuse. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Trevor, no other members have indicated that they wish to speak. Oh, oh sorry. Emma. I was trying to catch your, your air. <coughs> thank you both um, for, your, for your presentation. Um, Following on from, from what you had said there about the, the conversation that was had around preparing and within the Executive Office, the fact that there is a difference of opinion, and obviously then you referred to the Good Friday Agreement and the constitutional uh, question and the fact that the principle of consent uh, relates to that. How do you square the fact that the North didn't vote for Brexit? Well, the um, referendum result um, was taken on a UK I, I uh, wide uh, basis. But we're talking about the North. So you, so the majority of the people. So if we're talking about like the, we're talking about the rights that are going to be affecting people here and people that live along the border and all the different things that Martina referred to there. And the majority of the people in the North didn't, didn't vote for Brexit. So um, we have made it clear time and time again that we want to get an agreement so that those issues do not become uh, issues, that the fears that have been, been expressed uh, do not come to, to fruition. Um, look, we knew whenever we voted in the referendum in 2016 um, that there was one question and that it was a first, it was, uh, the result would have been on the basis of whoever got the most votes uh, across the, the United Kingdom. That was always what was going to be the case. Um, whereas we have in the agreement a very established and clear way of how things are changed. Um, it's very clear that um, the consent principle applies not to whether or not uh, we stay as members of the European Union, but whether we stay as members of, of, of the United Kingdom. Um, it's very, very clear that um, any change uh, that takes place within the Assembly on who makes our rules, who makes our laws. There's the consent mechanism that is built in in terms of cross-community uh, as well. Yeah. So we knew whenever we were voting that we were voting as one nation, uh, and that was going to be uh, the, the, the result. Whereas you, you've referred there to the principle of consent, and you're talking there about potential division down the Irish Sea and the, the impact of the Internal Markets Bill and how that was against the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement because of the principle of consent. Mm -hmm. But that has only arisen as a result of something that the people of the North didn't vote for. Yes, but that was, it was always going to be the case that we were but voting you, in a national you, referendum. You, you acknowledge there that there is a 
sort of an inconsistency no, with your saying? No, because there's, there is no consent here. We haven't even been asked the question here but then about whether we, we want that, about whether we want the border and in, 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 in the in the area. Because people have made um, the comments that in some way that it's the uh, that, that Brexit does damage to the to the Good Friday Agreement. It doesn't. We are still a member uh, and will remain to be a, a member of the United Kingdom. We took a vote on that basis as, of, as full members of the United Kingdom. Your vote was worth as much as, as anybody else's. Well, the North didn't vote to leave the EU. Yes, the, but the UK, UK as, as a whole did. did. But yeah. there are going to be impacts for people in the North. And when we're talking there about a land border, that impacts people who live here. And what I'm saying is that I don't want to see any borders. I don't want to see uh, uh, anything that stops trade north, south, or east, west. And that's what we are united on here um, as an executive. And that's what we want there, to there achieve. Definitely I don't there. think that we're going to come to. Uh, no, we're not. Um, but I just I think that, there's I think all. there's a, a lack of sense in referring to it in one instance and not acknowledging that that we you know. And I'm saying that. And I'm saying the that okay, we're straying into the territory of a conversation rather than all conversations being through the chair, please, and one person speaking at a time. That helps certainly those that are taking the notes to be able to understand what's happening. So I think we have we bottled out that we're not going to get agreement here, but yes. points are being. Chair, can I made. just ask one more question? And yes, yes. It's not, it doesn't relate to that. So you're talking then. Um, obviously, I know you've met the the Dairy Chamber of Commerce. And the constituency that I represent, Mid Ulster, has a, a small area across the border. Are you going to be talking to business groups in the other council areas, in terms in terms of people that are impacted on the border region? So I suppose at the, at the last meeting we agreed to Miss Anderson's request to meet the, um, the the group from the northwest, and um, we've probably got ourselves into the situation now we're going to be um, <laughs> meeting all sorts of groups from all your constituencies. <laughs> Look, um, engagement is something that is, is a big part of what we do in relation to to Brexit. I'm more than happy to uh, continue to. Uh, to do that, I'm, I'm sure Declan, Declan is as well. And if invitations are, are sent in, we will of course consider them. And positively so, mm -hmm. because part of the weekly business when we deal with EU exit affairs specifically addresses ongoing engagements that are being carried out by other ministers, by other departments, by our own department. And that particular engagement was was very instructive. Uh, but uh, we are we're engaging with the, the labour movement and other business organisations on an ongoing basis and would have no difficulty meeting with uh, business organisations, labour organisations, agricultural producers from any of the counties in the uh, region, Antrim, Derry, Fermanagh, Armagh, Tyrone. Happy to do so. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go now to George, who's indicated that he would like to ask a question. Go on ahead, George. Thank you, Chair, and uh, for this work with my business as well. Um, just a very brief one. We're in a time limit just at the moment, but I just want to support my colleague, uh, Junior Minister Lyons. I think he's, he's been very, very clear and um, um, given very, very clear answers here today, and um, I can congratulate him on everything that he said, and I agree entirely with, with uh, Gordon. Um, well, one small point that I'd like, like to uh, bring to, to the committee. Um, from the virus's point of view, uh, could could a second wave of the virus, could, could, could that affect uh, the future outcome? In, in relation okay. to the uh, negotiations, yes. Um, I yes. yes. In relation to that, we should should carry it in there. In relation to the negotiations, could, could the second wheel, if there any possibility that that could, could affect the overall outcome? So, so, George, certainly it has affected the, the nature of the meetings. Um, they've uh, had to, I suppose. They, they took a more online um, basis than, than meeting in, in, in person. However, I think the um, government have have made it clear their desire to to get this finished, and um, I, I don't think even that even a second wave would um, limit the the work that needs to be done to the point um, where where this would be 
uh, push back any further. Obviously, it's too late now anyway for the uh, extension. Um, so I think it is the 31st of, of, of December is the um, is, is that obviously 15th of October has been mentioned as well. So I hope that we can that we can get to that that point where it's finished <coughs> because the most important thing. Because as a, there, yeah, and, and I think that's right, George. Because as you as you know, um, mm -hmm. what businesses want is certainty, uh, and we need to give that that certainty to businesses. Which is why I hope that we can get that agreement in place as soon as possible, so businesses can pre prepare for whatever needs to come after. Thanks very much, Chair. Okay, thank you, George. Um, Trevor, I suppose that, I mean, in terms of what George had asked, and Gordon's response, I see it makes an interesting thing in terms of where we are at. And I mean, I suppose in terms of where Duke's been at and Preston's been asked about what next and what the planning is, but is there a financial package to actually stimulate business on the other side of this? Yes. Um, and what does that look like? I, there, is, um, there has been funding that's been made available. I don't have the exact figures here, but through the Business Support Service, I believe there was a, uh, a, a sum of money made available to try and help um, businesses to transition during that time, Trevor, yeah. 155 million, I think it says. 155. Okay. Okay. Um, junior ministers, I I know you look forward to coming to visit us, and I hope that that was uh, an enjoyable enough session. We appreciate your uh, answers. Um, we did take a little longer of your time than we anticipated, but we appreciate that it's a very complex issue, and that the answers can be quite detailed, and that there are varying views uh, in the chamber and also within the executive office so that can take a little bit longer um, to present them but we certainly appreciate you coming along there are a number of um follow-ups not least that if next week we have those officials in about uh, <coughs> the readiness for a new deal if they could be well prepared and, and we don't get officials saying we need to go back to ministers and, <coughs> and clarify that for you if we could get that information it would be appreciated Thank you very much indeed. Members, we're going to take our ease for a few minutes because we need to prepare the chamber for the changeover uh, in our um, guests. So if people want to take two or three minutes while we prepare for that, thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, you're welcome back. We have the room uh, cleansed and sorted and ready for the next guests that are in. We're going to move on to a discussion about the Victims' Pension Scheme. Uh, members on page 110 of the meeting pack are the relevant papers. Page 21 of the table pack for the departmental briefing paper, which was received late, uh, but we did get it circulated to members on Monday morning. Um, the officials in, are in attendance today to brief us on the latest position in relation to the Victims' Payment Scheme. And I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome Mark Brown, the Director of Strategic Policy, Equality and Good Relations, and to Gareth Johnson, the Director of Equality, Victims and Human Rights in the Executive Office. As usual, we are uh, recorded and um, being broadcast live at the moment, just to make you aware of that. And maybe uh, we'll pass to yourselves to give a presentation, and then we'll take some short questions from members afterwards. Hey, thanks very much, Chair, and thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'll just give a, a brief update based around the briefing paper which we provided uh, on, on the Victims' Payment Scheme. Um, I think the first point to make is that both the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister are entirely committed to delivering uh, the scheme. And on the 24th of August, the Executive Office designated the Department of Justice as the department to exercise the administrative uh, functions of the Victims' Payments Board on the Board's behalf under Power 2.1 of Schedule 1 to the Victims' Payments Regulations. The Office also agreed to provide grants to the Department of Justice to establish the administrative arrangements for the scheme. And this will allow for the uh, recruitment of Board members, IT developments and the other steps that are necessary to uh, establish the Board. The Justice Minister has indicated to the uh, Assembly that her aim is for the scheme to open for applications in early March. Um, there's a substan substantial programme of work is underway uh, with DOJ, and TEO officials are meeting regularly with DOJ compensation services and have discussed their respective responsibilities and input to the implementation of the scheme following the designation of DOJ as the, as the department. And this regular liaison will continue throughout the, the implementation of the scheme. The Lord Chief Justice expects the funding issue to be resolved promptly, and in anticipation of a formal appointment, he has made a judge available to help with the development of the scheme. And DOJ officials are liaising with uh, the, the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Commission (NIJAC) on the details required for job descriptions, terms and conditions, the numbers, and the complement for the appointment of board members uh, to enable the appointment of board members to progress. TEO and DOJ officials are also uh, engaging with a potential assessment service provider uh, on the design and development of an assessment methodology. The discovery stage of the IT solution commenced on the 21st of September on Monday, um, and this will include exploring ways of ensuring that the application's interface is as intuitive as possible for people who are making applications. In terms of evidence gathering and information sharing, uh, TEO and DOJ officials continue to engage with all the relevant bodies. Uh, this includes the drafting of evidence gathering protocols and service level agreement and information sharing agreements for the consideration of the board. Officials have also had a number of meetings with sector representatives and discussion will continue on a fortnightly basis for the foreseeable future 
in order to ensure the sector is fully informed of developments and has the opportunity to input as implementation progresses. In relation to exceptions, the Secretary of State's guidance on exceptions was published on the 14th of August. Turning to funding, it is recognised that there remain significant challenges which will need to be overcome in order to successfully deliver the scheme, including the adequate funding for the duration of the scheme. And in accordance with the normal government budgeting arrangements, <coughs> a request will be made for the necessary funding uh, set out in paragraph 9 of Schedule 1 of the regulations with the Department of Finance as the need for that funding falls due. The First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, along with the Finance Minister and the Justice Minister, will continue to seek additional funds for the block grant from the Secretary of State and through him the Treasury to address the financial pressures uh, created by the scheme. And this is in accordance with the Treasury's statement of funding policy. A meeting between the First and Deputy First Minister, Justice Minister and the Finance Minister was held yesterday on the 22nd of September to agree the uh, approach to be made. In relation to costs, it's, it's difficult, as we've discussed before with the committee, to estimate the cost of the scheme with any precision, given the uncertainty over the number of <coughs> applicants who may come forward, and in particular the numbers with psychological injuries and the extent of those injuries. And whilst the initial estimate uh, of 2,000 recipients was based on figures uh, on victims and survivors in contact with existing services, and total numbers could significantly exceed this, the, the fact is that there is no comprehensive record available of all of those who were injured in troubles related incidents. So officials are pursuing further information in relation to those who may have been severely psychologically injured in a troubles related incident uh, with a consultant psychiatrist at QUB. Um, and this work is still in progress, but it suggests an estimated figure somewhere between 3,500 to over 7,000, some of whom will be double counted in the initial 2,000 estimated figure. So work is ongoing to scope out uh, the figures uh, regarding the number of individuals in Northern Ireland who are in receipt um, of injury pensions uh, from the armed services. And officials are currently finalising detailed scoping work to model the potential range uh, of costs, which will then be used to inform uh, the uh, administration of the scheme uh, going forward. So that's just by way of introduction, Chair, and we're happy to take any okay. questions. Thank you very much for that uh, presentation and information. Um, I suppose you know this is one of the most sensitive and, um, at times, and in places, controversial um, elements of the, the, the work that you're doing, um, but it is one that is needed to be progressed and, and there needs to be a movement on it. Um, I suppose some of the issues that you have raised in your paper there, you mentioned that the Justice Minister has said that she hopes to have the scheme up and running for March of next year, but I suppose the question is, like, how can you prepare and have something uh, and say that something will be up and running in March? What will happen if you do not have the funding? Will it, I mean, can you progress everything up to the point of this is how much you will get? But but we don't know how much money is in the coffers to hand out, or you know how much of the the, the process will uh, take place in the absence of knowing what money is available. Well, clearly, Chair, the, the, the first, as I said, the first and deputy first minister have made it clear they're committed to the scheme, and as has the, the justice minister, uh, and also that the, the, uh, any request for the funding required will be made as it falls due. In other words, as the costs, uh, the anticipated costs, start to to uh, become necessary. Uh, and to crystallise, um, the department, the TEO, will bid uh, through through DOF for the, um, the funding that is required. Two and a half million pounds has already been made available this year to allow the initial preparations uh, to be made um, to 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 have the scheme in place. And we'll be working with the Department of Justice to help them to put in place those arrangements to ensure that. As far as possible, the, the, the time scale set out by the Justice Minister uh, of March for, in terms of opening for applications is able to be met. But, I mean, and again, I, I appreciate there may never be answers to some of these questions that I'm asking, but from the executive's perspective, on the hoof isn't exactly an awe inspiring answer whenever you say how you're going to prepare for the money that's needed. I mean, you, does that mean you get to the end of one month and realise you need five million, so you go and ask for it? The next month it's 20 million you ask for it. I mean, where do you ask for the money from if it exceeds the money that's in the pot? 
Well, the, 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 the intention is to, is to seek the money from the Department of Finance in accordance with the normal government, government budgeting arrangements. So we're coming up to uh, uh, um, a budgeting uh, outlook of, of three years um, where um, the, the need for funding uh, will be set out by all departments over the next three years and the executive will have to consider what allocations can be made. As part of that, there will have to be estimates put in for the costs of this scheme. Um, and then, of course, um, the executive will have to make decisions about the funding that's going to be made available in light of all the, the bids and requests that it, it has received. Um, so th that's, that's the process, and ministers have, have agreed that the necessary costs will be put forward as part of, the, of that process. If it turns out that uh, allocations are made and either um, all the funding isn't required in any one year or indeed the opposite, that some uh, additional funding is required, the normal monitoring arrangements provide for additional uh, bids or indeed easements to be made. And it would be as part of that process that um, the department would seek, seek the funding for the scheme. But quite often those normal monitoring rounds generally are for we need an extra million for this programme, an extra three million for that, or sometimes in health it can be a little bit more significant, twenty million for that. This overall scheme could be running to hundreds of millions of pounds that are extra. And you know, there's normally in the experience that I've seen from I've come here in terms of monitoring round, there tends to be around about somewhere between eighty and a hundred million that's available that has to go right across the whole executive. This programme has the potential to zap up all of that money for the next number of years that nobody would be able to get anything else if you just use monitoring round funding for it. Could, would that be a potential outcome? Well, uh, uh, there's no doubt that, that this scheme uh, will create financial pressures, which will have to be dealt with and, and considered alongside the other financial pressures. Uh, and that is why uh, the First and Deputy First Minister and the Finance Minister uh, have made it clear that they will be seeking from the Treasury, through the Secretary of State to the Treasury, uh, additional funding to the bloc to help to defray some, some of, of the costs uh, associated with this going forward. And of course, that, then that, that, that additional money is that based on there being 2,000 recipients or 7,000 recipients, depending <coughs> on. I mean, that's quite a variance. So, how do you prepare a bid for something that's so vast in terms of the estimates? Well, we're, we, are, we are currently working in, in the executive office and working alongside DOJ uh, uh, officials uh, to, to scope out the cost and get greater. A, a greater degree of, of um, understanding of how the costs uh, might arise and what the range of those costs might be. Uh, we will then have to um, make, make our best estimate of what the likely numbers of people coming forward are likely to be, and also uh, take into account what the likely um, pace of determinations and decisions might be, uh, because it's only when determinations are made that the actual costs crystallise, other than administration costs, the, the ongoing administration costs. So we will have to make judgments around that. Uh, but that is where the flexibility that's in the system to bid within a year and either to bid again for more or to ease if those um, assessments aren't, aren't uh, in line with what actually happens in terms of the determination. That's where that flexibility comes in. <coughs> I think, you know, the British government legislated for this. They pushed it forward and have left us in a scenario where we're having to open a scheme without knowing how many people can apply for it, and then we have to pay for it is where it is at the moment. So I think that just leads us right back around to saying that the British government should be making a substantial contribution to this scheme um, because of the scenario that it's left, left us in here. Just finally, a very quick one. You, you, you said in your report, and you did mention it in, in your updates there, that the Lord Chief Justice expects that the funding issue to be resolved promptly. Is that, does he have some inside knowledge there, or that's just his expectation is that it's solved promptly? Well, um, I think the, the Lord Chief Justice is working on the basis that uh, the First and Deputy First Minister have made clear that they will seek the funds uh, uh, from the Department of Finance, or through, through the Department of Finance, in line with the normal procedures and on, on that basis when the funding is there he will uh, formally appoint the president and he has really identified a, a judge who's working with us on some of the details uh, of so the it's it's his wish that it's promptly rather than he knows it's going to be promptly well i think it's his 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 hope and expectation um yep. but yes he doesn't have any insight there's no inside track there that oh, we not, don't okay not, not that i'm aware of okay. <laughs> a good response at the end i'm going to pass to the uh, deputy chair to doug thanks sir uh, Chair, and, and, and thank you, um, Mark Gareth, for, for, um, for being in front of us here and, and giving us this. It is, it is contentious. We, we know it's contentious, and we'll all have our, our views on it. 
The board members, I didn't catch it. I, I, I think I might have just missed it. When do we think they will be set by? When do we think we will actually have the board members set up and ready to start sort of making sure they're trained in, ready for this to start? Well, um, we're, there's really work ongoing with NIJAC to work through the detail of the, the job specifications uh, and, and the processes for, for recruiting board members. Uh, the, the Justice Minister has said that she would, she would hope that the scheme can open for applications by March. Um, so we, uh, I think the expectation would be that uh, the board would be uh, in place to receive applications and be able to make determinations as soon as possible after that. We don't have a precise timetable uh, as yet ar around that, but we would hope it would be as soon as possible after, after March. Right. Okay. So, so, so it wouldn't be aimed to, to get them in before March so that they can be a board and be trained and, and, and go well, through uh, it. And that's, that, that's certainly the, um, the basis on which uh, Department of Justice and, and NIJAC are, are working. Um, it's, a, it's a different arrangement in this legislation from we had in the HIA legislation where the uh, Chief Justice appointed the, the judges and then the executive office uh, appointed the other members, which maybe gave us a little bit more flexibility. Uh, in this legislation, these are all judicial appointments. They're all done through the Judicial Appointments Commission, um, and uh, that has an, uh, an impact on the timetables. But certainly, the aim that we're talking to NIJAC and working to is that members would be available in advance of that go live for applications so that they could settle the things like the policies for the board and so on that need to be settled in advance. And I think to give confidence as well, I mean, people will be looking at the makeup of that board, who's on that board, and, and we need to make sure that our whole society have confidence in regards to that board uh, as well. Um, I'm not going to touch on, on the money side of things. I think the chair covered that quite well. And what I would say is, is I'm absolutely in agreement that the UK government should be stumping up a sizable chunk of this, you know, because it is a UK wide scheme uh, and victims are right across the world, including Canada and Australia uh, and other, 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 other places. But I would remark that because of our failing in the assembly, that's why Westminster had to set do this in the first place. You know, that's why legislation came through Westminster and not this place here, is because we weren't here. So I think it's slightly unfair to, to just blame them on that. But, but the last point, can I just ask this one um, on information sharing? How does it work if somebody comes before the scheme, um, uh, having been in, involved in, in something in the past? Um, uh, terrorist related and applies for the scheme uh, and divulges information as part of his application form. How does the information sharing work in regards to the police? Um, will that information automatically be sifted by the police to make sure that there's no new evidence from crimes past? Gareth, do you want to pick that one up? Um, yeah, there, there is discussion uh, that has started with uh, police about evidence gathering protocols and, and what exactly the, those look like. Um, now, my expectation is, and uh, certainly in the conversations we've had with the sector about the format of an application form, um, that people would be invited up front to disclose um, if they had a conviction that needed to be taken into account um, under the term, terms of reference of the, uh, uh, the regulations. Um, and uh, yes, I would expect that that will be subject to um, some kind of check. Um, it, it is grounded, the exceptions are grounded in uh, convictions and various kinds of convictions that people would have, uh, and uh, the Department of Justice obviously has access to the criminal justice, uh, the criminal records viewer, uh, which would allow those things to be to be checked. So, uh, yes, we anticipate that there will be some kind of check as part of the eligibility. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Okay, Pat. Okay, thanks, Chair. Uh, welcome back, Mark and Gareth. Uh, don't know how many times it is now. Um, <laughs> Just, just on the time scale for early March, I'm, I'm slightly concerned, given the complexities of this, that we might be raising hopes just to dice them. Are, are, are you confident, Mark, that we'll be up and running? Applications will be, will be able to come in in early March. 
Well, I mean, that's the time frame that the Justice Minister has set out, that she's hopeful that, that, that it can open for ap applications at that point in time. And in our discussions, and we've obviously been in close contact with, with the Department of Justice officials, and we will continue to work with them closely on this. You know, we've looked at what the requirements are around the scheme and looked at, looked at some of the experience we had with, with the HIA in terms of setting up a similar type board and some of the processes and the time it took. Um, and all of that's fed into... You know, that, that, that broad assessment uh, uh, in, t in, in terms of time frame. Are you but optimistic? It, sorry? Are you optimistic we'll hit that target? Um, I, I think, I, I think that, that target is achievable. Um, I think it, it, <coughs> it, um, if it's, it's a challenging target, um, but I think it's one that, that, that we, are, we, 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 will, we will do our best to um, achieve. And again, um, we can open for applications. Um, and we will want to be able to make determinations as soon as possible after that. Um, but it is possible that there might be some further processes that need to be put in place after the application is open. Not everything might be completely in place from, you know, from, from start to finish, but um, I think that we can still work towards that time frame for opening for the applications. So is there, is there a possibility there could be a fairly lengthy time lag between the receipt of applications and the payment? Uh, at the end of the process? Well, there's a whole range of factors come in there, Pat. There's, 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 will all the arrangements actually be set up? Will the board all be there in place and all the, the processes all agreed? And we'll be working uh, with, with, with all the necessary agencies to try and make sure that that is the case. Um, but in order to make a determination, um, an application has to be received. It has to go through, be checked for the eligibility in terms of a trouble-related incident. All those other aspects of whether any exceptional circumstances apply have to be worked through. And then there has to be, if necessary, a medical assessment, potentially, depending on whether or not there's been uh, what, what records have come in with the application. Uh, and then it's at that point you can make a determination. So there, uh, it's a whole process uh, that has to be in place to allow that to, to allow determination to happen. Now, some cases will be more complicated than others. Um, there are, there, we, would, we would expect, as again was the, was the same with HIA, and in some cases there are victims who have very extensive records, medical records or other, who are in receipt of services and who will be able to put in an application that will be relatively straightforward for the panel to consider and to make a determination on. Um, so we'd expect that there would, there would be a number of those that could potentially have early determinations. On the other hand, there could be others where maybe all the records aren't there, or including the medical records, or where there are difficult decisions around eligibility, and some of those will take longer. So I think it's just, you know, it, it depends on the application and depends on the amount of information and, 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 and on the systems, the appropriate systems being in place. And just going off on a wee bit of a tangent, in, in terms of all the discussions that are taking place around this process, what, what, what engagement is <coughs> between the NIO and the executive office, the victims' teams? Well, we had engagement at an earlier stage when we had an oversight board and NIO uh, were, were represented on the oversight, the oversight mm. board. The extent of that engagement now that um, the, uh, the legislation is in place has reduced, but we are still in contact where we need, for example, to try and get some information, if there's any information that they might have, or advice on how we might get information. For example, we, we, we wrote to NIO recently um, just to find out about how many um, um, military there might be in receipt of a, a pension and to get more inf information around, around that pension. So we do have some ongoing contacts like that, but in the main, we're now, it's now ourselves and DOJ who are taking forward the delivery of the, of the, 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 um, the scheme. Okay. Could, 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 I move, could I move on to the situation in regard to uh, the courts? And has there been any discussion around how the courts will interpret the NIO guidelines? And um, I suppose also what impact the remarks of Brandon Lewis will have on the issue around the independence of the board, his, his uh, assertion that the, the British government reserves the ability to exercise a power to intervene and seek reconsideration of decisions by the board. Well, the, the, the guidance, as you know, was, was, was um, drafted and finalised and agreed by the Secretary of State, uh, and it was the NIO that, 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 that determined that. And the, um, the President of the Board will have to have regard to that in reaching his determination. So he will have to look at that, that guidance 
and interpret that in an appropriate uh, way. Uh, in, re in relation to the comment by the Secretary of State, my understanding is that the Minister of Justice um, has written to the Secretary of State asking him for clarification around that point, um, and, and we await a response on that. And is there any discussion around how the uh, the courts will be impacted operationally? You know, in terms of the appeal of decisions and so on. Is, is the Lord Chief Justice any fears that the the system could be adversely impacted uh, by this particular scheme? Given well, given the given the lack of clarity, I suppose around the guidelines and uh, Brandon Lewis's. Uh, Utterances. Well, part of the process that, that the the, uh, the board will have to go through, as indeed the HIA had to go through, is looking looking at its processes, looking at its procedures. And they'll have to look at the guidance and uh, um, come come to uh, an understanding of how it believes that guidance needs to be interpreted and applied. And that will be something for the president to do. I don't know if you have anything further on that. Um, the, uh, well, in terms of appeals from individual decisions, um, they would be dealt with by the Victims Payment Board itself, by a different panel within the, the Victims Payments Board. Um, but you know, there, there is always the possibility, as there has been until now, of challenge, um, of uh, judicial review challenge. Um, whether that is of the Secretary of State or uh, of, uh, of matters closer to home. Um, but uh, certainly in terms, of, in terms of appeals in individual cases, it will be the board that will deal with those rather than the wider court system. Okay. And, and just finally, Chair, I wanted to uh, discuss the design and, de design and development of an assessment methodology. I was wondering if you could flesh that out a bit, and particularly uh, I was wondering what role uh, victims groups in particular would have in all of this, because I think it's probably essential that there's, there, there's, there's, there's co-design and co-production in this whole process, because nobody knows the victims sector better than the groups that are represented, groups like WAVE and RFJ uh, and so on. So. For example, what role do those practitioner groups have? And, for example, have their premises been considered as assessment centres? And will there be any sort of quality assurance and oversight uh, of this uh, assessment methodology when you take account of all the difficulties there were in the likes of PIP uh, and, and the complaints there were and the number of cases that were overturned on appeal and so on. We, we, we don't want to go back down that road again. I know there's a lot there, but mm. um, I'd like to hear your views okay, on it. You've been on the detail list. Yes. you want to just pick yeah. that one up? Yes. Um, there is a certain amount of the assessment methodology that is already available because um, the scheme um, <coughs> mirrors a lot of the aspects of the industrial injury scheme, for example. So there is material there. Um, there's a, a handbook on uh, industrial injuries um, that we will be able to, to borrow and to, to use. Um, uh, I think that will be um, is probably better spelled out in terms of physical injuries, which is what people in industrial injuries uh, most often experience. Uh, I think it will need some more fleshing out on uh, psychological, uh, where there are um, broader indications uh, of the, the different levels, um, but the what exactly falls, you know, 14 per cent to 20 per cent, 20 per cent to 30 per cent and so on, uh, needs, some, needs some more work. Um, Department of Justice and ourselves will be working um, the plan would be with uh, Capita uh, to develop this assessment scheme and, uh, and then to roll it out. Um, in the discussions that we've had up until now with Capita, now we're not yet, uh, DOJ isn't yet in, in contract with them, but in the discussions that we've had up until now, um, this point about uh, what have you learned from PIP? Um, 
and how do we bring uh, the victim's focus th th that is written into the legislation uh, as a, a key principle, um, the need to prioritise and be responsive to the needs of victims of trouble-related incidents is the, the first of the principles that the Board has to have regard to. Um, so how, how do we do that is one of the, the key areas we have been discussing with them. Um, they have uh, been open about uh, what they have learned from the PIP experience um, with uh, liaison with VSS and with victims and, and survivors groups, uh, and are, are very keen to be able to, to bring that to the way forward, um, and to consult with groups um, as, as part of that. Uh, we, in the meantime, oh, sorry, sorry, just yeah, to stop you yeah, a second. Yeah. Uh, there's a difference between consultation and co-design, and uh, are you saying they're just going to consult? Um, well, I, I think people will bring different parties will bring um, their respective expertise to that. Um, so, in terms of uh, expertise on um, psychiatry, um, we would expect psychiatrists who've been working with us to bring that. Uh, in terms of expertise in uh, trauma and how do you make something trauma focused um, we would expect the victims and survivors groups to to, to, to bring that um, and in respect of how do you run an assessment methodology and what kind of practical issues do you come across then capital will bring that to the party so i think we can bring all of the aspects together into the design of this um, and uh, you know, respect the, com the contributions that different people can make and, and, and just a final short question um, thus far we don't have any sort of concrete uh, figures or estimates about what this scheme is going to cost or how many people are going to benefit from it. When can we expect to see something in black and white? Well, we're currently uh, um, still interrogating the figures. And, and as I said, we have written to um, the NIO to get a contact on, on, on the MOD to get some sense of um, the, the war pensions. Uh, how generous they are compared to victims' claims to see whether or not anyone who's in receipt of that would be likely to claim, or indeed whether their spouse would be likely to claim in the event that they pass away, and to, to help us to clarify that area of uncertainty and, and the same in respect of police pensions. So there are, there are, there are some uncertainties there that we need to uh, clarify. Um, and then uh, we, are, we are continuing to work with the psychologist at, uh, psychiatrist at, 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 at Queen's just to get a better sense around the numbers there. Um, so I would, I would hope that over the, over the next three to four weeks we, we would be in a position where we will be um, getting uh, the best estimate that we're likely to get. I mean, I, ma I made the point before to the committee that the reality is here we're never going to get an estimate that's going to be right. We're going to get our best estimate, and as numbers start to come in, we might start to refine that estimate because experience will tell us that, in fact, either more or less from certain categories are going to come in. But we've looked at all the different client groups uh, that, that are eligible. We're looking at the range of um, uh, levels of, of um, uh, numbers that might come forward. We have to make assumptions about the, uh, the average level of reward. There's a, there's a lot of moving variables in here. Um, and, I, and as I say, we will end up with what, what will essentially be a table, which will have a, a number of assumptions down one side and a number of costs across it. And, and, and in light of that, we will, we, will, we will make what we consider to be our best central estimate. And we'll put a lower and a higher. We've done that with HIA. We have to wait to see whether that's going to be right or not. And we don't know yet uh, about that. But we'll do that with this one. Uh, and we will then have to. The other thing is going to be quite difficult, actually, even when we get to that central estimate, is profiling uh, the year, each year's actual requ uh, uh, financial requirement. Because that depends <coughs> on the numbers that come forward, when they come forward, uh, and what the characteristics are of those that come forward, and also whether they go for. Um, lump sums, or whether they go for the long term. There's, there's, there's a lot of things in here that are quite tricky. Um, but all we can do is make the best estimate that we can, 
um, uh, bid for the, 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 the appropriate funding, and if that funding uh, turns out to be too high or too, too low, adjust through the, the normal uh, financial process as I described earlier. But do you think we'll have your best estimate in four or five weeks? Well, we're working to try and get that within that time frame because we realise that, that with, a, with an opening date of March, we need, to, we need to be able to give ministers the best information that we can for them also to approach Treasury around the, the, the detail of, of the funding that they may provide. Okay, thanks for that. Okay. Thank you. Emma? Thanks, Chair. I just have a short question. Thank you both um, for your presentation. Again, just around the evidence gathering, information sharing aspect. Um, obviously, a lot of the people that would have been involved in incidents during the conflict and people that perhaps suffered police brutality or got caught up in the middle of a riot or something and didn't report it at the time because of the nature of the place at the time. What what is, has been done to counteract that that um, decrease in in reporting retrospectively? Um, the, the the board will be open to uh, all the evidence that that um, someone can can bring, um, and uh, it's not the case in the legislation that if somebody didn't report something at the, the time um, that then they they won't be eligible. Um, so in that sort of situation that you've you've mentioned, um, there might be uh, medical records, uh, either contem contemporaneous or maybe of medical treatment that the people have, have sought since. Um, or or, or there, you know, there might be other kinds of records. They, um, we're working on drafting up for the, the board's consideration uh, an evidence gathering protocol, um, which will probably say, okay, for starters, you go to uh, police and see if they have records. And if there are records there, great, case moves on. Uh, if not, maybe you go to the health service. If not, then you look at, uh, for example, other published sources, newspaper accounts, those kind of things. So there will be a protocol to, 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 to be gone through. Um, but. Uh, and there will be support for people, um, and we're, we're talking to uh, Victim Survivor Service about what exactly that looks like. Um, there will be support for people in getting the evidence together, uh, and we're looking at how that can be delivered through the existing victims and survivors uh, groups. Um, so, uh, support for people in getting it together, but um, you know, ultimately the, the board will look at whatever people have and uh, whatever they're able to gather. It doesn't have to be from any particular source. Okay. Okay. Trevor Clark. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chairman, and thank, uh, thank you both gentlemen for your presentation. I suppose we're united in something in terms of possibly who the paymaster is here in terms of UK Treasury. But the thing that strikes me difficult for this one, of course, is that it's been a long road, but we still haven't quantified a cost. And I'm wondering how you go with the collection plate to Westminster saying, we need you to pay, but we don't know what it is. We don't know what you to put in this tray. I actually think the credibility of the work, and I, mean, I don't mean this personalise it towards you, but the work you have done in terms of your credibility will be diminished by the fact that you actually haven't got those answers. Because I think we're all collectively saying Westminster should stop up the most, if not all, of this money. But we don't know what that is. We're hoping to open the scheme in six months, but we don't know much to ask for. And, and I think, in, in response to some of your questions, or your, your responses today have been useful, except I think some of that work could already have taken place, because the records that the police and others would have held in terms of numbers with pensions was already there. And I'm wondering why some of that wasn't quantified. And in your own words, you've talked about best guests, best estimates previously. And I'm just scratching my head and wondering, six months out, there is a debate about who pays. We're all collectively saying who should do it, but we don't know much to ask for. And what I fear is that they actually may pay something, but it will be terribly short from what they should be paying. So at what stage is the real figure going to be on the table that the real ask comes about? Well, uh, probably a, a range of points to make in response to that, Trevor. Uh, I think the first point is that um, in terms of um, having a clear estimate, uh, the expectation would be that the body and the, and, and the, um, the organisation that was bringing forward the uh, proposal should actually cost it. In that case, it was the NIO, and it, was, it should have been the NIO who should have costed this, 
and should have looked at the business case and brought forward a business case which would have set out the costs, the benefits and so forth, and then we would have had the figures from the outset. So that is why we are coming from behind to try and make up ground in that regard. Now, there were some estimates done by NIO on the basis of the, of the 2000, but our, our belief on that is that that, that is, is, is well short of what is likely to come forward. So we have been trying to make up the ground uh, on that, um, uh, building on that 2000 uh, uh, figure. Um, and I explained earlier on we would hope to be able to move this on in the next matter of, uh, of, of weeks because uh, this is going to be a negotiation with the Treasury and going to the Treasury. What, <coughs> what we want to be able to provide to ministers as best we can is a breakdown of how the costs emerge from the various client groups and how they might come forward in terms of the numbers and so forth. So there can be then some, some discussion. Uh, around that. And there are different ways, I'm not going to get into the detail of how that negotiation might work, but there, 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 are, there are different ways in which that can be done. There are some uncertainties about the numbers that might come forward, and there can be an argument about what costs the Treasury should actually pick up. But we're going to try and break down the costs as best we can and put that to ministers, and ministers can then decide how they want to engage with the Treasury uh, around this. Um, as you say, it's 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 difficult um, to know what figure to go for if you're not certain about what the outcome might be. So whether you go for a figure or a category or a group, in terms of who picks up the costs, is again part of the negotiation. But all of this has to be worked through and decided. All we can do is make the best estimate with as much breakdown as we can, uh, set out the range, and then ministers will have to make a judgment as to how they engage with Treasury on this. Uh, and point, and in terms of NIL, I mean, I appreciate that one, Mark. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry, George. And, uh, ironically, um, we're going to Westminster and, and making a case to Westminster, but some of the information that is needed to, to do that, the executive doesn't have, Westminster has. Um, so that will be part of our discussions. That's fair enough. In, in terms of the board, the structure of the board, and did I pick you up saying running cost of £2.5 million, or, or, or did I miss, miss something there at the start? No, the, 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 the two the two two and a half million is, is the amount that's been made available that was made available in the uh, through a monitoring round this year in order to allow the initial setup costs uh, for the rest of this year to to to, to meet those those costs. Um, the, what the, what do you see the annual cost then? Um, I, I wouldn't like to speculate too much on the annual costs at this stage because it depends on the numbers that we predict and what the flow in those is going to likely to be. You what, it depends just, on, just go ahead and give us your best estimate. <laughs> it's, uh, well, there, there is a bit of chicken and egg in this, as, yes, as, as Gareth yeah, is yeah. alluding to, because well, if, I, if we know there's lots of numbers coming forward, we'll have to look at how many panels we need. Be, yeah. And you might want more panels to try and increase the flow. Uh, so there, there is a, a bit of chicken and egg as to, as, as, as to what but, you would do. Mark, with well, the best respect, you have to have a number there, because there's a budgeting process in terms of I mean, we're not going to get off scot-free here. We're going to have to do something on this side. So you have to have a number there. That's part of what we're working through with, with the Department of Justice, as I say, and, and uh, part of the work that we're doing around these overall costs that we hope to have sorted in the next matter of weeks will be costs uh, which, which, which will include the administration. And do you know what size this board's going to be? Um, that will depend, again, on the uh, numbers of, of throughput that are anticipated. What, what, what we might do, Sorry, can, can I and we've had this... How, yeah. how can it be driven by the throughput if you hope to have the board in place before the application is right. out? Because yeah. that's contradictory. Uh, sorry, I, and, well, maybe that was something I should have uh, clarified earlier, and, and apologies. Um, the, the, a board, the similar how, to how we did things with, with HIA, um, you can establish a board which can make the decisions that are necessary to open the, the scheme um, with a smaller number of people. So as long as you have got uh, your president and you've got uh, at least one legal member, uh, medical member, ordinary member, you can establish a board with that. Um, you can then add to that board um, as cases start to come in uh, and as the number of cases start to increase and you need more panels. Um, so on HIA we, we started off um, with a, a small shadow board uh, that was able to make decisions and then fairly quickly we added in um, further members to that who have been dealing with the, the cases. Um, so we're, we're planning for that um, small board but as to how many additional appointments are likely to be needed. That will depend on the estimates that Mark's been talking so about. So the small board you talk about, what, how big is that? 
Um, it would be something that will need to be discussed with the, the President. Um, potentially, it, I'm, I'm thinking between four and seven people, probably. And remuneration for that? Uh, is a matter that the Department of Justice is responsible for because uh, it, in the legislation, is required to set the terms and conditions for board members, uh, and I understand it's currently considering that and uh, in touch with NIJAC. And where would you, where would you, in your best estimate, again, where would you write that would be? I, I, I wouldn't, again, like to speculate because it's, it's not the executive office's responsibility under the legislation. It's uh, for the uh, for the Department of Justice. Yeah, thanks. Um, just on the, on the question of, of potential payments and the <coughs> lump sum versus uh, pension, would it be right in thinking that they, well, first of all, the, your claimants would have the choice, presumably, which they want to go for, in terms of the calculation of the benefit? Um, would, would it be the case that you'd, you would calculate an appropriate pension first? And then extrapolate from that what the lump sum would be, and that would, at some some extent, be based on life expectancy. Is that fair? Well, it's based it's based on the on the pension, but it's based on rolling it up for ten years, uh, and and the ten years lump sum being available, ten years worth of pension, uh, <coughs> some being available, and no further payments after that. Is that that's already. And that's when you reach age sixty, or if you're terminally ill. All right. Uh, just in terms of the funding, um, the Minister for Finance seemed to be in no doubt last week with the answer to question that's been answered now to me about the funding, and he's in no doubt, as far as he's concerned, it all falls to the NIO. And he quotes chapter and verse to justify it. It's something to do with whoever instigated the legislation. So. Uh, yeah, yes, I think he, he was referring to the statement of funding policy, uh, which was agreed between the Treasury and the devolved administration um, at the time devolution happened. Uh, and uh, essentially, that says that a policy making department is responsible for the costs of that policy. Thank you. Okay, George, you're looking to ask a question there? Yes, sir. Thank you. And thanks to Mark and Jarrett for their presentation. Um, just one quick question. Um, the, the board that's to be set up, will there be uh, medical personnel on, it, on the board? Would you, would you reckon? Yeah. But more or less to distinguish you know, <clears throat> people that have put on an, an application uh, from a medical point of view, that uh, someone there, someone from the board can assess you know that those um, hopefully innocent victims. Well, there's two aspects to this, isn't there, Gareth? The, the, the first one is the determination of eligibility, uh, and that's where, where in, in particular, the, the expertise is, is, is around determining whether someone is eligible for a payment. Uh, when it comes to the medical aspect, uh, it's, it's a requirement on the board to to have uh, um, a, a, an application assessed by a medical professional, and that's where the, the medical assessment that Gareth talks about comes in. So that medical assessment is done uh, uh, through whatever names is put in place there, and at the minute we're talking to, uh, and, and, and Justice will be talking to Capita about that, that assessment. So that medical assessment will, will, will come through that route, uh, unless, of course, there are existing medical records that are that the applicant uh, makes available with the application that can determine uh, the, the, the medical requirement? Yes. <clears throat> and um, just from the Treasurer's point of view, um, I, I, personally, I, I personally think that uh, they should be put, put in the bill, quite honestly, because in the block grant uh, that we get year in, year out, there's always a cut on it. And um, whilst I welcome these victims um, at long last, given a payment, it's long overdue. I, I think that uh, Treasury and the NIO should be putting the bill for it. Well, that's certainly a view that's shared by the, the Deputy First Minister and the First Minister and the, the Finance Minister and the Justice Minister, I think. Yeah. So fairly widely shared view here locally. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, George. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, and look, I think we're all 
aware that you have been left to implement the scheme and there are a lot of outstanding variables and the only way that we're going to be able to work out what the overall financial package that's required is once those variables are in place. And of course, the difficulty is we want to secure as much of that funding as possible from another source, and that requires us to know what the numbers are. And we can't work out the numbers until we know what the variables are, and, and we don't know what they are. But the fear, I think, that's probably being um, sort of articulated here today is that under all of this is that if we don't get that funding from the British government, it's going to have to come from the block grant, which means that we're going to have to make cuts to health and cuts to education and cuts to other sources yeah. at the present time. And that's a real fear. Uh, and it will create a, a, a difficult situation in the delivery. So um, there's a lot of information that needs to be worked out and progressed there. All we can do is wish you well with that in the hope that we can get some more information. I think we will ask you to come back again at a point in the future because I think it's important that we track this and know exactly what the ramifications are and where the progress is in uh, the delivery. Um, so thank you very much indeed and we'll give you a moment or two to, to leave before we progress on to the next items. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Members, we'll move quickly through the last few items. Um, we have uh, the forward work programme that is available at uh, item six, uh, which includes that next week, for example, we have officials from the TEO discussing the monitoring round. And as we mentioned earlier, we have some TEO officials in on the contingency planning and preparation for a no deal Brexit. Are members content to note the forward work programme? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Correspondence this week, uh, item seven. There is one item in the correspondence meeting pack and one in the tabled pack. Uh, one is in the tabled pack at item seven point two at page twenty six is correspondence from the committee of procedure on procedures. The committee has agreed to extend the temporary provisions contained within standing orders until the thirty first of January. The motion to extend will be considered by the assembly on Tuesday the twenty ninth of September. The committee is asking for any views in the temporary provisions and potential amendments. Does anybody have any overriding views that they wish to articulate to that committee, or shall we allow our silence to indicate that we're happy with those? Okay. Um, if I jump on that? Yeah. So we're content to note the rest of the <coughs> items in the. Uh, yeah. Fine. Okay. Item eight. Um, chairman's business. Um, I just want to take this opportunity as chair of the committee um, just to um, say that I absolutely and utterly deplore the threat that was issued to yourself, Doug, as uh, your vice chair of this committee. Um, we all know that there's absolutely no place in our society for violence. I know that you are steadfast in calling that out and calling out any criminality and any behaviour that you see that is inappropriate or doesn't stick to the law. And I'm sure that the members of this committee would stand shoulder to shoulder with you on that and um, would just say there's no place for that type of threat. Um, just to update members as well, myself and Pat met with the um, EU ambassador to the UK last Thursday and had a conversation with him. Um, it was pretty much in line with what we've heard to date. There was nothing too major about it, but we just reiterated a lot of the concerns that would be raised at this committee. And finally, in room wars, um, we are next week, unfortunately, not going to get access to the chamber. Um, we have to move back to uh, room 30. Uh, that will have two ramifications. Number one, it's going to bring us back to the two o'clock start, which means that we won't be finishing it near six o'clock. So it's got one uh, positive side to it. But the other is that there um, isn't a great amount of room for the full committee there. Now, I will investigate over the next week and keep members updated to see if it's the potential for officials, if they're presenting in groups of about two, that maybe they could come in via the Starleaf and that they could actually be on the screen and we can interact with them with questions and that might allow members into the room because the members are going to be there for the full meeting. The officials that are coming in are only going to be coming in for one item and then leaving. So um, it might be better 
for us to have more members in the room, but we'll work and see what the capacity is for that over the next week. But we will be moving to 2 o'clock, and it will be in room 30. Um, any other business from any member? Allows me to once again say that the date, time and place for the meet next meeting is next Wednesday at 2 o'clock in room 30. So, members, thank you very much indeed yeah, for your thank you, attendance Chair. and participation. Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed.